post your alibi in, in some extremely sophisticated way that would get it admitted into evidence or make it or you submit it for evidence would probably be where the crime occurs. So you're saying there are other things other than particularly altering, destroying, mutilating. I think he operated under the less is more theory and then was pushed to more is more after January 6. Okay? That's what I think. Not to conceal, but to disclose. So if I disclosed a witness list in a large multi-defendant drug trial, my purpose in doing that, though I haven't altered the document, would be to intimidate the witnesses or prevent their attendance. That, on our submission, would also violate secrecy. All right, can I just ask you one other question just so that I can fully understand your theory? You keep using the term evidence, and that does not appear in the statute. The statute C-1 says record, document, or other object. Now, I appreciate that, you know, evidence can be such a thing, but you can imagine a world in which those two are different. So where does evidence come in in your theory, and why is it there? Well, the, the, the title of the statute refers to tampering with witnesses, victims, and informants. But along with victim, excuse me, witnesses, victims, and informants comes evidence that they provide, whether in the form of testimony or whether in the form of documents. No, I understand, but the statute, the provision we're talking about here, does not use the term evidence. And so, and instead, or in addition, it uses the term official proceeding, which is elsewhere defined not in terms of, you know, court proceedings or investigations. It's just a proceeding, you know, before Congress. So is it your, provi is it your argument that the only thing that this provision covers is something that is tantamount to evidence in an investigation or trial? It, it is, Your Honor. And we're oh, not yeah. It. See our, if that makes sense. It's not limited to documents or records. Um, I would submit C-1, which we say carries into C-2 through the otherwise clause. I agree, um, Gal. It says other object is pretty broad. Um, and it need not be as, as, um, as 1512F provides. It need, it need not be admissible to you, F, yeah, F. It need not be admissible. So it, it could cover things like electronic records. It could cover communications. It could cover emails. It could cover all kinds of things that we think get used by fact finders in a formally convened hearing. I mean, just what to about, take you um, back to... Uh, just a quick question. What about the Second Circuit's decision in U.S. versus yeah, Reich? I think he had to save his wife. What was involved <laughs> was not evidence. It was a forged court order. Would that fall within C-2? Yes, we, we think that does fall within C-2. And I, I think anything that is falsified in this operative way that is um, used to obstruct a proceeding would, would be... Uh, covered by right, C2. Thank you. Yes. And just to take you back to the, the question that Justice Thomas started you with, I mean, there, it seems to me there are two choices here, and you could read this as otherwise obstructs a proceeding or otherwise spoils evidence. And you are using it to say otherwise spoils evidence with, you know, spoils being all those verbs. But it doesn't say that. It says otherwise obstructs a proceeding. There are plenty of ways to write the statute that you um, want to write. You could just say otherwise affects the integrity or availability of evidence in an official proceeding. You could combine official proceeding with evidence in other ways. You know, one with, uh, you could replicate the mens rea uh, that C1 has. I mean, there are ways in which C2, multiple ways in which the drafters of C2 could have made it clear that they intended C2 to also operate only in the sphere of evidence spoilation. But it doesn't do that. All it says is otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes. It, it, certainly the statute could be written more precisely. Any statute could be written more precisely. Well, it's not a question of precisely. The question is what is this otherwise, this is what Justice Thomas said at the beginning, what is this otherwise taking from C1. Of course there's commonality that's involved in an otherwise. There's I think purple is perfect. But what is the I think it says it sends a lot of messages. So I say purple, but I loved is. the pink. The I'm not going to lie. The things that fall I loved C2 like the rose gold. Have to so influence or impede. I don't know. You've got a pretty good canvas there, lady. Really does not say is everything in C2 also has to spoil evidence. 
But this court has said that otherwise in a criminal statute means similar conduct. Similar so conduct, obstruction of a proceeding, different ways of carrying out that similar conduct, which is obstruction of a proceeding. The statute tells you what the similar conduct is right on its face. Well, res respectfully, Justice Kagan, the statute tells you what the effect is. I got the my lashes on yesterday. Mm. Is altering, destroying, mutilating, or concealing a document, record, or other object. And so a drafter of the statute could easily omit something like that and would omit something like that for the sake of economy and also to hedge. Because we know that what comes before might not be exactly the same as after. So we're not going to repeat what we said there, but we're going to use a connector like otherwise to, to demonstrate that we're talking about similar conduct. And I would submit, Your Honor, that if you look at C2 alone, that is, uh, it, it, please. What's your best case for this, like, going backward and trying to find language that does not appear in the otherwise provision and trying to incorporate it into the otherwise provision? Well, I think the gay is our best case for sure. And that's not it a very good advertisement, I would think. I mean, what Begay does is exactly that. So you have a very good case there. And it was a complete failure. You know, Begay said, we look back at this other, at this thing that Congress did, you know, did not use in the otherwise She provision. seems kind of mad. We derive various things from it, and we put it in. It was purposeful, violent, and aggressive. And then a few years later, we said, where did that come from? We made it up, and we get rid of the whole thing. So that's not a great advertisement for rewriting a statute to, to, you know, to take an otherwise provision that says what it says and turn it into an otherwise provision that says something else. We would submit that Begay was abrogated on other grounds, Your Honor. And the other grounds are the court, the members of the court could not decide between an assessment of the types of things that came before otherwise versus the level of risk. And when that began to play out in complicated cases like Chambers and many others involving escape from a halfway house, it became, a, and the court said, an untenable proposition to figure out what a potential harm to another person might be looking at what came before. Well, that Mr. doesn't, that doesn't. And I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Green, go ahead what? and finish your sentence. Yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the court's holding about how to construe a statute and its significant holding about otherwise was abrogated in and of itself as a result of the cases that came after Begay. Well, I, I'm not a fan of Begay. Uh, some of us perceived at that time that there were problems, different problems, with what the court did there. But I, I, I think th there's a point in the colloquy that you've been having. The specific uh, types of conduct that are enumerated in one, alter, destroy, mutilate, conceal a record, document, etc., cetera, et cetera, have two things in common. One, they all involve documents or objects, and they also all involve uh, the impairment of uh, the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding. So the similarity could be either of those things. And so I, I think that uh, you may be biting off more than you can chew by suggesting, if, if you are indeed suggesting, that the otherwise clause can only be read the way you read it. One might say it can certainly be read the way the government reads it, and that might even be the more straightforward reading. But it is also possible to read a clause like this uh, more narrowly, and just Judge Katz has provided an example of that in his opinion. If you had a statute that says anyone who kills or injures or assaults someone or otherwise causes uh, serious injury, commits a crime, you wouldn't think that that applies to defamation. So it could be read your way. So then I think you have to go on to some other arguments and explain why your reading is better than the government's reading. Certainly. And I, I would submit, Your Honor, that there are plenty of other reasons why 
our reading is the better reason. And I'm not going to contest or bite up more than I can chew and say that the government's reading of C2 is implausible. Uh, we think it's unsound, but it's unsound for the additional reasons that if one zooms out and looks at what the prohibited conduct is in 1512 generally, we are talking about um, uh, uh, interference or operation on forms of evidence and testimony that, in, that obstruct a proceeding. That's what 12 is all about generally. Um, and um, I would submit, Your Honor, too, that um, as uh, the briefing indicates, Eus Gem Generis and, and Nositor Associus, those two venerated Latin canons, also operate in our favor here. Um, as well as the broader context of Chapter 73 and, and, and Section 15. All of these things are about doing things that, that, um, that obstruct a proceeding. And 1512 and 1512C zero in on witnesses and evidence. Well, you have other arguments. You have surplusage arguments. Uh, you have arguments about the breadth of the government's reading of the provision. Do you want to say anything about those? Right. Um, so uh, with respect to surplusage, Your Honor, I would refer to Judge Katz's opinion, as you did, in, in particular in the Joint Appendix at page 88, which lists out all of the different provisions in Section 1512. Fifteen of the 21 would be subsumed by uh, the government's reading of C2. Um, and the government's reading of C2, I would remind the Court, is so broad that it would cover anyone who does something uh, uh, understanding that what they are doing is wrong in some way, that in any way influence, impedes, or obstructs an official proceeding of any type. Well, Mr. Green, Maybe I think Maybe limited this, by federal. This, this, there's a good case that this provision Everybody knew it was going to be superfluous because it was a provision that was meant to function as a backstop. It was a later enacted provision. Congress had all these statutes all over the place. It had just gone through Enron. What Enron convinced them of was that there were, there were gaps in these statutes, and they tried to fill the gaps. They tried to fill the particular gap that they found out about in Enron, and then they said, you know, this is a lesson to us. There are probably other gaps in this statute. But they didn't know exactly what those gaps were. So they said, let's have a backstop provision. And this is their backstop provision. And of course, in that circumstance, I mean, superfluity is very often a good argument when it comes to statutory interpretation. But it's not a good argument when Congress is specifically devising a backstop provision to fill gaps that might exist. They don't exactly know how they exist, but they think that they probably do exist in a pre-existing statutory scheme. And that's what this provision is intended to do. Respectfully, Your Honor, a close reading of Yates, both the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion, demonstrates that this Court thought that 1519 was the backstop. That was supposed to be the omnibus provision. And the Court was fighting over what the meaning of tangible object was in 1519. But that was meant to plug the whole Council, I, I have such a hard time with the superfluidity argument because this entire obstruction section is superfluidity. There isn't one provision you can point to. You just said it. You can point to 1512 and you have 1519, which says destruction of evidence. How are they different? They're really not. Um, you can point to any series, uh, any provision, and point to superfluidity in this, in, this, in this section, 1512 and otherwise. So we go back to Justice Kagan's position, which is what you don't have is a freestanding, otherwise obstructs influence or impedes any official proceeding. I don't see why that's not the backstop that Congress would have intended, and it's the language it used. Well, it's an awfully odd place to put it, isn't it? I mean, in a subsection of a subsection in the middle back of the statute to, to include a provision well, I mean, that as suddenly you, as, takes like, over there's nothing of the about 21 other provisions. The one thing that Justice Kagan pointed to, which is clear, they wanted to cover every base. And they didn't do it in a logical way. 
but they managed to cover every base. Well, I think you can reconcile. I mean, again, that's what the court said about 1519 in, in Yates, and I don't understand how it is that the government can come before you today and say we need yet another catch-all, yet another omnibus crime that will sweep in all kinds of other. We didn't get what we wanted in Section 15, so now we'll go to 1512C2 and see if we can expand that in this way to cover something that it has never covered before. Thank and you. Thank Please. you, Counsel. Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, Justice Sotomayor. We've never had a situation before where there's been a situation like this with people attempting to stop a proceeding violently. So I'm not sure what a lack of history proves. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that that's true. I'd point to the Hatfield courthouse problems in, 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 in Portland, Oregon, but Let's, uh, let's also look at what the court has said in so many different cases, in, in Dubin, um, in Bond, in Yates, uh, in Kelly, all of these but cases. But there, there was a difference in the use of words. Here, um, otherwise obstructs, influences, or impede. You might have a problem with breath, and the government can address that, but it's not unclear what those words mean. But the government has no way to address its problem with breadth. Well, we can let them answer. Okay. Justice Kagan? Justice Kavanaugh? If it were just the language in C2 and so said, uh, whoever corruptly obstructs, influences, or impedes C2 without the word. Like beer! The whole provision, do you acknowledge that the language would then uh, apply, Good morning, Muskie. Like How this. you doing? Unfortunately, no. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, again, applying all the other canons and, uh, and applying the whole text canon and zooming out and looking at the at 1512, we would submit that C2 should still be read in the way um, we have suggested that it be read as something that is an evidence impairment statute. Um, I think also, as I mentioned, the Latin canons, the surplusage problem that C2 would create, all of those would still obtain if it sat there by itself without the otherwise. The otherwise is the icing on the cake. And finally, Justice Kavanaugh, I would mention that, um, as I mentioned to Justice Barrett, well, there's let an me issue. Just, if you didn't have C1, just had C2 without the otherwise, I'm not sure I was clear on that. Oh, okay. Well, in, in that case, I think it gets even harder, but I would still say if we look at what 1512 is about, it, and, and if we look at this court's cases on broad, implaus not broad, plausible, but broad readings of criminal statutes not being what the court adopts when there's an available narrow reading, because Congress can fix that, we would still say that C2 doesn't perform the massive dragnet function that the government submits. Thank you. Justice Barrett? Yeah, I have a question about the phrase in C1, the specific intent. Do you agree it's specific intent with the intent? I am still a judge, but okay. I can have my fundy What is your view about how voice, that parenthetical no applies to C2, if at all? Like, do you think that that intent requirement carries over? The corruptly C2? intent requirement? Uh, not, not corruptly, uh, the, with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding. Yes, we do, Your Honor. So it carries over. And we say that's the object of, of, of the overarching mens rea. But how can that be? I mean, it seems like that, you know, C2 would read awfully oddly then. It would be otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding. That would be your position of how it would read? Well, I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's awkward. I mean, there's no doubt that it's an awkward statute. But if you, if you do the operation that I talked about earlier, which is we're just going to use otherwise to replace the verbs and the nouns in C1, then, then the statute makes perfect sense. With respect to intent, I mean, I think Your Honor makes an excellent point, which is that this intent is a specific form of intent the corruptly, which has been construed to be the mens rea up there, is not different than, uh, at least on this reading, is not, is not di or on the accepted reading it by the D.C. Circuit right now, is not different than, than some form of specific intent. Uh, so corruptly is redundant? It seems like it's getting to be, yes. 
Okay. That's Thank true. You. And I, our submission is that corruptly should mean something different. So should proceeding. That's how you marry 1512 with 1519. Justice Jackson. So I'm just still tr wondering if your theory about this provision might be too narrow in a sense because you've got evidence going and spoliation in a sense. What, I, what I'm trying to work out in my mind is um, whether you would still have a decent argument if this 1512 language um, is read to prohibit the corrupt tampering with things that are used to conduct a, an official proceeding with the intent of undermining the integrity of the thing or access to the thing and thereby obstructing the proceeding. It's not just evidence. It's an official proceeding. Um, C1 is an example of, uh, you know, the uh, corrupt uh, tampering with certain things, and C2 broadens it out a bit. It's not just documents and records. W what do you think about that? Well, I, th I think that's a, that's a correct reading, Your Honor. I mean, we're, is, as, um, as 1512 um, F demonstrates, it doesn't, you know, 1512 F, we would submit, actually supports our position because it says the evidence need not be admissible or free of a privilege claim. Now, what would that mean about what the statute of addressing if it's not evidence? But that C2 has been applied, and, and occasionally C1 has been applied. In a non-evidentiary way. Yeah, to, to, to things that could become evidence, to the efforts to shape someone's grand jury testimony, All right, let to me answers to interrogatory. Let me ask you about the question that Justice Barrett asked before. Um, you know, you, you suggested that it has to be to the document, but uh, the, in other words, the, the, the activity has to be actually to the document. But I don't know why that's the case under C2. Justice Alito says, well, one of the commonalities between C1 and C2 could be th the impairment of the object's integrity or availability. Justice Barrett posits a scenario in which you uh, have someone who is impairing the availability by doing something to prevent uh, the object from getting to the proceeding. Why wouldn't that count under C2? So this is, this is, you know, preventing Congress from counting the electoral votes, for example. Let's say it's being done. She says it's in an envelope going to the, the uh, vice president's desk, and someone does something to impair or prevent that from happening. Why isn't that what C2 um, could cover? Well, it, it, first, it's not affecting the integrity of the document, Your Honor. Or, or the, availability or, is also I mean, in the statute. Availability, it says, too. But as I mentioned earlier, simply delaying... Um, the arrival of evidence at the courthouse. No, not delay. Let's say the person steals the envelope and takes it away. Then it gets harder. I agree. They steal the envelope, they take it away, they rip up um, all of those things, which is certainly not what happened here, and it's not in the indictment. The, the ballots or the, the vote count is not even in the indictment. But we, we wouldn't have to decide oh, see that. You, gal. We send it back if we clarified that that is what the statute means. I'm trying to understand if you agree that that's what the statute could mean. No, I don't agree that that's what the statute Why not? The, the reason is that if you look at 1512, it is about a direct effect or, in some senses, an indirect effect, but in a limited way, on evidence that's to be used in a proceeding, right? And, and proceeding, as I mentioned earlier— So as to limit its availability. So, so what I'm suggesting is in C2, if you're doing something to limit, it, to, to, uh, limit its availability, why doesn't it count? Because we're limiting the availability of its use by a fact finder in a proceeding. Again, that's the way to marry 1519, which covers all kinds of investigations and all kinds of other events, with 1512. 1512 is talking about evidence that's going to a formal convocation, uh, some kind of hearing before the Congress or before any other body. Thank you. The language says. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. General Prelogger. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. On January 6, 2021, a violent mob stormed the United States Capitol and disrupted the peaceful transition of power. Many crimes occurred that day, but in plain English, the fundamental wrong committed by many of the rioters, including Petitioner, was a deliberate attempt to stop the joint session of Congress from certifying the results of the election. That is, they obstructed Congress's work in that official proceeding. 
The government accordingly charged petitioner with violating Section 1512C2, an obstruction offense that directly reads onto his conduct. The case as it comes to this court presents a straightforward question of statutory interpretation. Did petitioner obstruct, influence, or impede the joint session of Congress? The answer is equally straightforward. Yes, he obstructed that official proceeding. The terms of the statute unambiguously hey, easily conduct. welcome. Petitioner doesn't really I argue love her that too. his actions fall outside the plain meaning of what it is to obstruct. Instead, he asked this court to impose an atextual limit on the actus reus. In his view, because Section 1512C1 covers tampering with documents and other physical evidence, the separate prohibition in Section 1512C2 should be limited to acts of evidence impairment. But that limit has no basis in the text or tools of construction. His reading hinges on the word otherwise, but that word means in a different manner, not in the same manner. And the two prohibitions in Section 1512C2 aren't unified items on a list where you could apply associated words canons. They're separate provisions. They have their own sets of verbs and their own nouns. They each independently prohibit attempts, which would be duplication that makes no sense on petitioner's reading. And Congress included a distinct mental state requirement in C1 that it chose not to repeat in C2. Section 1512C2, by its terms, is not limited to evidence impairment. Instead, it's a classic catch-all. C1 covers specified acts that obstruct an official proceeding, and C2 covers all other acts that obstruct an official proceeding in a different manner. The court should say so and allow this case to proceed to trial. I welcome the court's questions. Uh, General, uh, there have been many violent protests that have interfered with uh, uh, proceedings. Has the government uh, uh, applied this provision to other protests in the past, and has this been the, the government's position throughout the lifespan of the statute? It has certainly been the government's position since the enactment of 1512C2 that it covers the myriad forms of obstructing an official proceeding and that it's not limited to some kind of evidence impairment gloss. Have you, With, so have you, have you enforced it in that manner? We have enforced it in a variety of prosecutions that don't focus on evidence tampering. Now, I can't give you an example of enforcing it in a situation where people have violently stormed a building in order to prevent an official proceeding, a specified one, from occurring with all of the elements like intent to obstruct, knowledge of the proceeding, uh, having the corruptly mens rea, but, but that's just because I'm not aware of that circumstance ever happening prior to January 6th. But just to give you a flavor of some of the other circumstances that's a little legal burn. under this provision, for example, there are situations where we've brought C2 charges because someone tipped off the subject of an investigation to the grand jury's hearings. Uh, there was another case where someone tipped She's off quick. the identity of an undercover law enforcement officer. And in those situations, there's no specific evidence, no you know, concrete testimony or physical evidence that the conduct is interfering with. Instead, it's more general obstruction of the proceeding. So Justice Alito mentioned the Wright case as well, and that's another one where it was a forged court order that prompted the litigant to dismiss a mandamus petition, but that didn't have anything to do with the evidence that was going to be considered in that proceeding. So what role does uh, C1 play in your analysis? So we understand 1512C to split up the world of obstructive conduct of an official proceeding into the C1 offense and into C2. C1 covers everything it enumerates. It's the acts of altering, concealing, destroying records, documents, or other objects. And then C2 would only pick up conduct that obstructs an official proceeding in a different way. So there's no duplication or superfluity on our reading. Instead, Congress was taking this universe and dividing it up into the two separate offenses. And I think that's actually a virtue of our reading as compared to petitioners because I have not heard him articulate anything that would fall within C1 that wouldn't also come within C2. So on his reading, C2 really does just swallow C1 whole. Well, I mean, in the way you're reading it, uh, C1, C2 uh, uh, almost exists in isolation, certainly not affected by C1. We don't deny at all that there is a relationship between the two provisions, Justice Thomas. What is that relationship? And the relationship is the one Congress specified in the text. It's what follows the word otherwise. That is the relevant degree of similarity. What both C1 and C2 have in common is that they, uh, they or aim at conduct that obstructs an official proceeding. C1 does so in one way, tampering with records and documents. C2 does so with respect to all other conduct that in a different manner does that. And I think that this has to be the road the court goes down to look at what Congress actually prescribed with respect to similarity. Because in contrast, if you take up petitioner's invitation to come up with some 
atextual gloss from C1 to port over into C2, I don't understand what the court could look at to guide its determination of exactly what the relevant similarity would be. Yeah, uh, General, uh, I'm sure you've had a chance to read our opinion released Friday in the Boissonnette case. It was unanimous. It was very short. Uh, <laughs> but it explained how to apply the doctrine of Houston generous. And it, what it said is that specific terms, a more general catch-all, if you will, term at the end, and it said that the general phrase is controlled and defined by reference to the terms that precede it. Uh, the otherwise phrase is more general, uh, and the terms that precede it are alters, destroys, mutilates, uh, or, or and seals a record and document. And applying the doctrine, as was set forth in that uh, opinion, the specific terms, alters, destroy, and mutilate, carry forward into two, and the terms record, document, or other object carried, carry forward into two as well. And it seems to me that they, as I said, sort of control and define the, uh, the more general term. So, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I think that the I mean, I'm sorry, just to interrupt so I oh, put, yes. put out exactly what. And, and the otherwise means in other ways. It alters, destroys, and mutilates record, document, or other objects that impede the investigation and otherwise, in other ways, accomplishes the same result. So I think the problem with that approach with respect to 1512 is that it doesn't look like the typical kind of statutory phrase that consists of a parallel list of nouns or a parallel list of verbs where the court has applied a usedom generis or the noscator canon. You know, these are separate prohibitions that have their own complex, non-parallel internal structure. And I think actually the best evidence that it's hard to figure out how you would define a degree of similarity between them just based on the word otherwise is that th there are multiple competing interpretations at issue in this case. You know, Justice Alito touched on them, and they're reflected in the competing interpretations between Judge Katsas on the D.C. Circuit and Judge Nichols on the District Court. Competing interpretations of what? So which and, and it relates to exactly the, the question you asked me, which is that Judge Nichols thought that C-1 should limit t C-2, and he looked at it and said, well, the relevant thing about C-1 is it deals with records, documents, and other objects. And so that means C-2 should be limited only to other acts that impair physical evidence. Meanwhile, Judge Judge Katsas looked at the specific intent requirement in C1 to take action that impairs the availability it's really of incredible the hubris, and isn't it? Water gloss to put on C2 and say, no, but that's be simply other saying impairment of all that, of their evidence. Well, they're just applying the same doctrine to different aspects of it, and I think you do that as, as well. It, it, what are the common elements? Alters, destroy, and mutilates a record or a document. You have the first few: what you're doing and what you're doing it to, and you and you apply both of those in, as it said in. Boisonet controlling and defining the term that follows, so that it should involve something that's capable of alteration, destruction, and mutilation, uh, uh, and in, in, with respect to a record or a document. That's, that's so how I you, actually that's don't why, even understand. When you, when you apply that doctrine, uh, again, as we did on Friday, uh, it, uh, it responds to some of the concerns that have been raised about how broad uh, C2 is. You can't just tack it on and say, look at it as if it's standing alone, because it's not. So let me respond to that in two ways. I do want to have a chance to address any concerns about breadth. But the, the more fundamental point, I think, is that I don't even understand Petitioner to be suggesting that you can mix and match the verbs and the nouns. From right, C1 Jen, it's so obvious. Judge like, Nichols had a more limited view that it, it's that not Nichols even hidden. Focuses on How do we get here? Objects. It wouldn't apply to things like testimony because of the limitation that he gleaned from C1. Judge Katzis, I think, may be in line with your question, would interpret it more broadly. And the, the basic point as a textual matter is that there is nothing in the text of C2 itself to disclose what the relevant similarity from C1 ought to be. Instead, we think the relevant similarity is obstruction of an official proceeding, because that's the language Congress chose. General, if, that's, if, that's, if that's the case, what work does authorize do on your theory? Because I think I, I would might, as I'm hearing you, think that uh, whoever corruptly obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so stands alone. And the otherwise, I'm not hearing what work it does. Can you explain to me what work it does on your view? Yes. So the work that otherwise does is to set up the relationship between C1 and C2 and make clear that C2 does not cover the conduct that's encompassed by C1. <clears throat> now, I acknowledge that there were Beyond that, beyond that, beyond saying, okay, C1 does some things and the whole rest of the universe of obstructing, impeding, or, or influencing 
is conducted by C2. Is that a fair summary of your view? Yes, but there was a good reason for Congress to do it this way. Oh, it I traces to the I statutory just, ha- yeah, history. I, I understand and, that. And I would just I, say I, that I, if I might, um, so so what what does that mean for the breadth of this statute? Um, would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? There are multiple elements of oh the statute that I think might not God. be those hypotheticals, and it really so to gross. The Chief Justice about the breadth of this statute and greed uh, and the, the power grabs limitations are the things that I think would potentially suggest that many of those things wouldn't be something the government could charge or prove as 1512c2 beyond a reasonable doubt. Would include the fact that the actus reus does require obstruction, which we understand to be a meaningful interference. So that means that if you have some minor disruption or delay or some minimal. Outburst. Okay, we don't so, think it falls so within the my, my to begin outbursts with. require uh, uh, the court to, 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 to reconvene after after um, the, the proceeding has been brought back into line, or uh, the, the pulling of the fire alarm. The vote has to be rescheduled, or uh, the, the, the protest outside of a courthouse makes it inaccessible for a period of time. Are those all federal felonies subject to 20 years in prison? So with some of them, it would be necessary to show nexus. So with respect to the protest outside assume, the courthouse, we'd can, have to show I that, think, yes, they I were aiming I've at shown, the proceeding. I, yeah, they were trying to stop the proceeding. Yes, and then we'd also have to be able to prove that they acted corruptly, and this sets a stringent mens rea. It's not even just the mere intent to obstruct. We have to show that also, but we have to show that they had corrupt intent in acting in that way. We and went around that tree yesterday. I, I know. I, I, uh, I heard the argument yesterday, but... I guess what I would say is that to the extent that your hypotheticals are pressing on the idea of a peaceful protest, even one that's quite disruptive, it's not clear to me that the government would be able to I'm show not sure that each one that is. protesters had peaceful corrupt protest intent. That is that Gorsuch? And impedes an, an official proceeding for an indefinite period would not be covered? Not necessarily. We would just have to have the evidence of intent. And that's a high oh, no, bar. I, 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 they they right. intend to do it all right. Yes, if they intend to obstruct and we're able to show that they knew that was wrongful conduct with consciousness of wrongdoing, then yes, that's a 1512C2 offense. And what does corruptly was- add in your view? So corruptly adds the requirement that the defendant's conduct be wrongful and committed with consciousness of wrongdoing. And this traces to the court's decision in Arthur Anderson, where the court said this is a term with deep historical roots, with a settled meaning, and that it connotes not just knowledge of your actions, which is, you know, the intent to obstruct in this case, but further requires that it be done corruptly. And just to give you a more concrete example of how this has played out in the January 6 prosecutions, I'd point to the jury instruction in the Robertson case, which we refer to and quote in part on page 44 of our brief, there the jury was instructed that in order to show the defendant acted corruptly, the jury had to to conclude that he had an unlawful purpose or used unlawful means or both, and that he had consciousness of wrongdoing. So I think that that is an encapsulation of what the jury is asked to decide on top of the mere intent to obstruct. General, let me give you a a, a specific example, which is, picks up, but provides a little bit more detail with respect to one of the the examples that Justice Gorsuch provided. So we've had a number of protests in the courtroom. Let's say that today, while you're arguing or Mr. Green is arguing, five people get up one after the other and they shout either keep the January 6th insurrectionists in jail or free the January 6th patriots. And as a result of this, our police officers have to remove them forcibly from the courtroom and let's say we have to de- – it delays the proceeding for five minutes. And I know that experienced advocates like you and Mr. Green are not going to be flustered by that, but, you know, in another case, an advocate might lose his or her train of thought and not provide the best argument. So would that be a violation of 1512C2? I think it would be difficult for the government to prove that. Why? At the outset, we don't think that 1512C2 picks up minimal, de minimis, minor interferences. We think that the term obstruct on its face connotes a meaningful uh, interference with the proceeding. Well, it doesn't blocks. say, I, I'm sorry, uh, it, uh, C2 does not refer just to obstruct. It says obstructs, influences, or impedes. Impedes is something less than obstructs. 
I think that this is a verb phrase where iteration was obviously afoot. And well, okay, is but also the, the plain as meaning, you're, you're preaching the plain meaning uh, interpretation of this provision. The, the plain meaning of uh, impede in Webster's is to interfere with or get in the way of the progress of to hold up. In the OED, it is to retard in progress or action by putting obstacles in the way. So it doesn't require obstruction. It requires the causing of delay. And if this so again, why wouldn't that fall within? Now, you could say, well, we're not going to prosecute that. And indeed, for all the protests that have occurred in this court, the Justice Department has uh, not charged any serious offenses. And I don't think any one of those protesters has been sentenced to even one day in prison. But why isn't that a violation of 512, uh, uh, 1512C2? We read the actus reus more narrowly. Now, perhaps you could look at some of the broader dictionary definitions and adopt a broader understanding of the actus reus. Still, there would be the backstop of needing to prove corrupt intent. I think that's a stringent mens rea. Well, that's and not the a corrupt of- intent. They, they, uh, it's wrongful. Do you think it's not wrongful? I could imagine defendants. Hi, CF. Thanks for coming. See you later. Right to protest, they might say that they weren't conscious of the fact that they weren't allowed to make that kind of brief protest in the court. And I think it's in a fundamentally different posture than if they had stormed into this courtroom, overrun the Supreme Court police, required the justices and other participants to ple- flee for their safety, and done so with clear oh, evidence yes, of intent indeed. to obstruct. Absolutely. What happened on January 6 was very, very serious, and I'm not equating this with that. But we need to find out what, it, what are the outer reaches of this statute under your interpretation. Let me give you another example. Yesterday, protesters blocked the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and disrupted traffic in San Francisco. What if something similar to that happened all around the Capitol so that members, all the bridges from Virginia were blocked and members from Virginia who needed to appear at a hearing couldn't get there or were delayed in getting there. Would that be a a violation of this provision? It sounds to me like that wouldn't satisfy the proceeding element nor the nexus requirement. Why Why would it not satisfy the proceeding? Let's say they want to get to the Capitol to vote. Well, if we, had clear, if we had clear evidence that the purpose of the protesters who had set up the blockage somewhere, some distance away from the court, was because they had a specific proceeding in mind, maybe you have the proceeding, but still the court has required a nexus, and that's been the requirement in cases like Marinello, Aguilar, and, and Arthur Anderson, where the court has said it does real narrowing work because you have to show that the natural and probable effect of the action is to obstruct. There has to be re- a relationship in time causation and logic. But Justice Alito, the other thing I would say to this set of concerns is that there are other obstruction provisions, including in 1503, 1505, the tax obstruction statute, 7212, that use this exact same formulation that the court has characterized as an omnibus clause and never suggested could be subject to an evidence gloss. So I don't think that to the extent you have concerns about those hypotheticals, your your question about what would happen in this Ooh, would deep by cut easily. Deep cut. Isn't going to cure Let me that give issue. you one. One more uh, example. Uh, An attorney is uh, sanctioned under Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure by filing pleadings, written motions, or other papers uh, for the purpose of causing unnecessary delay or needlessly increasing the cost of litigation. And in a particular case, Ooh, judge, good news, gal. Welcome back. Article uh, uh, Rule 11 sanctions because, and says this caused a lot of trouble. I can tell you it, it, it caused at least five work days uh, with, uh, for me personally, all of this unnecessary paper. And it delayed the progress of this litigation. So I'm imposing Rule 11 sanctions. Why doesn't that fall within your interpretation of this provision? Congress created a specific safe harbor in 1515C. It's reprinted at page 17A to the appendix of our brief that specifies that advocacy or legal representation that is conducted as part of a proceeding shouldn't be understood as obstruction. So I think Congress was itself trying to draw some lines around participation in a proceeding on the one hand versus external external forces that obstruct the proceeding on within, the other hand. But it but falls com- within the language, doesn't it? What, what kind of evidence do you typically uh, present in these January 6th cases to prove the corruptly element. 
So the January 6th prosecutions require us to show first that the defendants had knowledge that Congress was meeting in the joint session on that day. We have to show that the defendants specifically intended to disrupt the joint proceeding. And then with respect to using unlawful means with consciousness of wrongdoing, we have focused on things like the defendants' threats of violence, um, willingness to use violence here. We allege that petitioner assaulted a police officer. We have focused on things like preparation for violence, bringing tactical gear or paramilitary equipment to the Capitol. And I want to emphasize, Justice Kagan, that this is a stringent mens rea requirement that has very much constrained the U.S. Attorney's Office. We've charged over 1,350 defendants with crimes committed on January 6th, but we've only had the, only had the evidence of intent to bring charges against 350 for a 1512 violation. So how do you violation. make that decision? How do you decide which defendants get um, charged? Oh, good reminder, easily. Thank you. To not. The dividing line has hinged usually on the evidence we have of intent. So we're looking for clear evidence that the defendant knew about the proceedings that were happening in the joint session in Congress that day, clear knowledge of the official proceeding. We've oh, we love the lurkers. I love lurkers. Lurk away. Certifying the vote. Enjoy. And I love being the background of your life. That is fantastic. What an honor. Knowledge of wrongfulness or unlawful conduct can come about with respect to particular preparations that the defendants have made. And, you know, there are a number of cases where even though we thought we had the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, there have been acquittals because there was, you know, testimony that was credited that the defendant thought the proceedings were over and wasn't intending to obstruct. Or one person thought and said he thought that law enforcement was waving him into the building. So even in situations where we think we have amassed the evidence, we still haven't always been able to sustain these convictions. And it's because of the stringent mens rea. General, can I ask you about your obstruction theory? Um, because you said that you see 1512C as dividing the world of an obstruction um, and that the, the nexus between one and two is the official proceeding and the obstruction of an, of, of an official proceeding. I guess what I'm concerned about is how you then account for the rest of 1512, where official proceeding comes up over and over again and particular acts that one could view as obstructing the official proceeding, like killing or threatening or intimidating witnesses, yes, is covered. Jen, yes. So that if we read it's toking Tuesday to be obstructing a, an official proceeding, I don't, I don't understand what happens to the rest of those provisions. So to the extent you're pressing on the idea that there's surplusage, I, I don't think that that's true. There is certainly overlap or duplication. That's true on both of the readings in this case. I think in, in part, it might even be more true on petitioner's reading because he says that C2 is likewise focused on all of the evidence impairment ways to obstruct, interfering with testimony, interfering with documents and so forth. And so that very same duplication is going to be present on his reading. But with respect to superfluity, our interpretation doesn't create any technical superfluity, and that's because each of those other provisions that you cited, and, and in fact, each of the other provisions of the obstruction laws, cover situations that 1512C2 wouldn't cover. There are three principal distinctions. The first is that some of them have less than a corruptly mens rea. So for many of the provisions, they can be violated in ways that wouldn't require the government to prove corruptly. Joe, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, we got your back, Joe. Them, no worries. You and Kamala. The Mamala. <laughs> more broadly than an official proceeding. They apply in a wider range of circumstances. Tell Dr. That Jill we all say hey. In those situations where we can't actually prove the official proceeding element. And then third and finally, some of the provisions have a, a higher penalty specifically because they target more culpable conduct. And that's like 1512A, the one you referenced about killing a witness. There the government would charge under that provision because it's subject to higher penalties than C2. All right, so well, there's no well, actual Can I ask you, would the, would the government necessarily... Um, lose in the sense that they would not be able to bring charges against some of the people that you have described with Justice Kagan if we looked at C2 as being more limited, perhaps not all the way to evidence, but um, related to conduct that prevents uh, or obstructs an official proceeding insofar as it is directed to preventing access to information or documents or whatever the official proceedings. I, I explored with Mr. Green Democracy and, and, and Coven. Just, Justice Barrett the idea that to the scared Jeff the Clark out of his pants votes were being counted that day and um, that's done in a you know documentary way in our system uh, it, they're interfering by storming the Capitol might qualify under even an evidence or document 
um, interpretation of C2. Does the what, what does the government think about that? Yes, I think that if the court articulated the standard that way, these would likely be viable charges. And as we note in the last footnote of our brief, we've, we've preserved an argument that we could satisfy even an evidence-related understanding of C2, in part because the very point of the conduct when we have the intent evidence was to prevent Congress from being able to count the votes, from being able to actually certify the results of the election. Now, we'd obviously need to evaluate whether these charges can go forward based on whatever this court says. And I would very much caution the court away from any holding that would require specific evidence by the government of, you know, precise electoral certificates or that kind of thing. Here, the, the point of it would be that the those who came to the Capitol and engaged in this criminal conduct to displace Congress violently from, from where it had to be to count those votes acted with an intent to impair Congress's ability to consider that evidence. General, the district court and the dissent below um, had a Jesus different variation easy. on the statute. You are so right starting to explain that to the chief. Um, could you do it if uh, we accepted the district court's view? I, I s presume that you could do it if we accepted uh, the dissent below, correct? Yes. Yeah, so but I your whole response to Justice Katanji, um, to Justice Jackson, sorry, <laughs> to Justice Jackson is that it, it assumes the dissent's view. I thought that Justice Jackson was potentially proposing even a broader view, including focusing on the availability part and making clear that when the whole point is to prevent the proceeding, including the consideration of evidence in the proceeding from happening, that could qualify. Okay. I think it becomes potentially harder on the, the Judge Katz's view and especially harder on the Judge Nichols' view. And that's precisely because Judge, Judge Nichols seemed to think that to prove obstruction, it had to be limited to taking action with respect to the documents themselves, and that would be a difficult standard for us to satisfy. You read our discussion on corruptly yesterday. It's clear. You've um, endorsed the Robertson view. Could you tell me um, what you feel about the Walker view, Judge Walker being the part of the majority below? I, I assume you know that, but. Yes. So Judge Walker articulated an idea that corruptly has to turn exclusively on the government being able to show that the defendant sought to secure an unlawful advantage for himself or someone else. We certainly agree that that's one way for the government to prove corrupt intent. It's a way that has traditionally been deployed in the tax context because the very theory of the case is that the defendant is violating the tax laws or taking efforts to secure an unlawful advantage under the tax laws. But I think that it would be incorrect for the court to suggest that that's the exclusive mechanism for the government to try to prove corruptly. You know, there are various other ways where we might have evidence of, as we think we do here, unlawful means committed with consciousness of wrongdoing, and there's no basis in the common law or in how the term corruptly has long been understood to limit the government's abil ability to prove it only with that one specific way that Judge Walker pointed the to. The drawer in this case um, appears to be the fear that reading the government's view of either yesterday's case or today uh, on its plain terms, would make it so broad that um, somehow that presents a problem. Um, I think the judges below struggled with that by saying that gets addressed in the word corruptly and in the nexus requirement, which is the point you've made today. But neither of those two issues were um, resolved below because that wasn't the question below, correct? That's right. The only issue that the D.C. Circuit resolved was the meaning of the actus reus. And the only issue between us is whether we read the words, um, how we read these words. That's right. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact, as your question touched on, that there are inherent constraints built into the other elements of the statute. The nexus constraint is a really critical one. It is the, the paradigmatic constraint the Court has pointed to to ensure that obstruction statutes don't sweep too broadly and scoop up everyday conduct that might be happening out in the world. It has to have that tight connection, the relationship in time causation or logic with the official proceeding. And of course, corruptly, we think, sets a very high bar as evidenced by the fact, as, as I said to Justice Kagan, it's not like we can even prove it with respect to everyone who was in the riot at the Capitol on January 6. Thank you. General, are you putting a violence requirement as an overlay on obstruct, influence, impede? And I'm, I'm thinking of some of your answers to Justice Alito's hypotheticals. It seemed like you kept emphasizing the aspect of violence that was present on January 6. So am, am I understanding you to say there has to be some sort of 
violence or no? No, we don't think that's a requirement under the statute. I think it will clearly be easier for us to satisfy things like the corruptly mens rea when we can point to action here, like assaulting a police officer that is obviously wrongful, unlawful conduct, and everyone knows that that's a crime and you cannot do that. What I was trying to say to Justice Alito is in situations where hypotheticals press on the idea that people are engaging in conduct that maybe they think is constitutionally protected, they might be wrong about that. There might not be a First Amendment right that they think they have, but that can demonstrate that they don't have the requisite consciousness of wrongdoing that would mean we couldn't prove an obstruction charge. Uh, thank you, counsel. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I understood um, the answer you gave earlier about whether or not you've previously used uh, uh, C2 uh, in, in this type of case. Ha have you done that before or not? We have charged C2 in situations that don't involve evidence impairment, and the litigating position of the department has long been that, as its plain language suggests, it covers myriad ways of obstructing. I'm not aware of any other factual circumstance or event out in the world where we could have proved all of the elements of Section 1512 C2 beyond the cases where we've brought those prosecutions. So, yeah, and Just so I understand, the prosecutions are limited in what way? They're limited to a requirement that the specific people had in mind an official proceeding, so that would take out the category of hypotheticals Sorry. where, you know, maybe right. you're protesting a branch of government, you're outside this court, but you don't have this specific argument in mind. And then we would also need to show an intent to obstruct the proceeding and the nexus to the proceeding, and that can take care of, you know, situations where maybe someone's and pulling you've, a you've fire alarm that. in a different building, but yeah, it's not yeah, even where me. the proceeding happens. In prior cases, you have applied C2 in a situation, what, not involving specific documents? Correct. So things like tipping off someone to the existence of a grand jury investigation or the identity of an undercover officer or creating a fake court order that has nothing to do with the evidence in the case but is just prompting the litigant to dismiss a pending mandamus petition. And, and your, friend's, uh, point, your friend points to a, an Office of Legal Counsel opinion um, uh, from 2019 that uh, I haven't looked at it yet, but I will. He says it is uh, consistent with Judge Katz's uh, opinion below. So that, that um, advice that was offered to the Attorney General and never adopted as a formal position of the Department of Justice related to distinct issues that arose out of the special counsel investigation and distinct issues that involved the office of the presidency, I don't think that it would be right to suggest that the memo took any firm stand, although it did suggest that maybe 1512C2 should be understood more narrowly, but it, didn't, it certainly didn't represent any formal adoption of that position, and that would have been inconsistent with how the government has always litigated under C2. What constitutes a form? Formal uh, acceptance of OLC opi uh, opinions. I should probably know the answer to that one uh, as yeah, a matter of, too, of DOJ <laughs> policy. But what, what I can tell you is the reason I'm saying that wasn't an official position is because it specifically said there's no need to go down the road of even deciding exactly what 1512C2 covers because even in, uh, assuming that it covers the full range of obstructive conduct, the allegations, according to the memo, didn't satisfy the standard there. So it ultimately just punted on the issue and said it's not necessary to engage with that issue further. Thank you. Justice Thomas? Uh, General, uh, the, um, you said, uh, as I understand it, that you have applied uh, C2 in previous cases? That's right. We've applied it in cases that do not fit the evidence impairment model that petitioner is urging on the court here. And it's not just C2, Justice Thomas, but it's the omnibus clauses of 1503, 1505, 7212. You know, these are statutes that use the exact same I, verb Those are fine, I, but um, C2... Yes. Um, the uh, I don't. I'm not clear as to whether or not the specific instances in which you have used C2, because you seem to think that C or argue that C2 is a standalone provision almost. We think that it covers the full range of obstructive conduct that's not covered by C1. Of course, limited by the requirement of an official proceeding. So, if if you have applied C2, uh, is have there been previous, other than the D.C. Circuit, previous uh, courts of appeals that have looked at this? Yes, and the uniform consensus among the Court of Appeals has been that C2 is not limited by this kind of evidence impairment gloss that petitioner is asking the court to read into the statute. There has been no Court of Appeals that's gone the other way. We cite a string side of them that have recognized, looking at the plain language of this provision, that it sweeps in the myriad forms of obstructive conduct. So much of your argument seems to hinge on uh, this being fairly clear, the, the, uh, your uh, interpretation of C2. Yes, we certainly think we have the best of the plain text. Okay. If we think, if, 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 if I happen to think it's more ambiguous, uh, what would your argument be? 
So uh, what I would say is I think that if you look at the terms in the statute themselves, that the plain language of the statute supports our view, but it doesn't end there. And I, was, I have mentioned several times the other provisions in 1503, 1505, but we think that's actually really relevant because Congress wasn't writing on a blank slate when it enacted 1512C2. It's not like it just thought of for the first time this verb phrase obstructs, influences, or impedes. That wasn't taken out of the ether. That was a well-established term, verb, phrase, and obstruction law drawn from those other statutes. And as this Court has said many times, when Congress takes a phrase like that, it brings the old soil with it. And so Congress would have clearly known that the courts, this Court and lower courts, had interpreted the omnibus clause in those other statutes to encompass the full range of obstructive conduct. That's also consistent with all precedent, as I mentioned to you earlier. So I think when you put it all together, there's no real ambiguity here. We, we clearly have the best reading. And and the only other thing, the icing on the cake, if I could, yeah. is that if actually what Congress wanted to do is write a statute that focused only on evidence impairment, there was a really clear and obvious way to do it. Congress could have just tacked on a residual clause to see one that says, or otherwise impairs evidence. It would not have used this oblique reference of otherwise and then used a term that had a well-settled meaning in obstruction law to sweep more broadly to try to convey that type of limited scope. It would just be nonsensical for Congress to draft that way because it would be so readily misunderstood. And in fact, every lower court has understood Congress to have legislated more broadly here. But that's beginning to sound more like a contextual argument, uh, which you seem to eschew in this case. Well, no, I, I think actually that the statutory context and history does bear weight here. And we think that the roots of this language and those other obstruction provisions help fortify or reinforce how the court has always understood the plain language. Justice Alito? You argue that there's a, an exception for conduct that has only a minimal effect on official proceedings. Where does that You are goo. Context? That's what I heard. <laughs> you are goo. Or impede, which we think, if you look at dictionary definitions, um, conveys the type of action that blocks, hinders, makes difficult, persistently interferes with. Uh, you know, this is the, the kind of, the verbs themselves, we think, inherently contain this limitation. There can't be a minor impediment? I think as a colloquial matter, yes, maybe. But, you know, I, we think that if you look at what Congress was trying to do as a whole, the lead term here is obstruct. These were various ways of trying to capture the world of obstructive conduct. And I think that that adequately conveys the idea that some kind of very minimal de minimis interference doesn't qualify. Well, it didn't stop with obstruct. It, it added impede. But what is the meaning of uh, how would you define a, uh, a minimal interference. I suppose a jury would have to be charged on that. In order to prove that the person violated this provision, uh, you must find that the person committed more than caused or intended to cause more than a minimal interference. How do you define it? So I think, you know, to the extent that this would come up in actual prosecutions, and I'm not aware of any, but if this came up, then I think that it would be the defense theory. It's possible that the court could decide it as a matter of law if, in fact, it was so minimal it doesn't fit within the statutory terms themselves. And I recognize that maybe there could be gray areas about the nature of the obstruction and whether it really satisfies the actus reus. I think that is properly I mean, a subject What about the, the example I gave you about the five protesters in the courtroom? Is that minimal? I think that sounds minimal to me. I mean, it sounds to me like if it hasn't actually forced any substantial halt to these proceedings, it seems like that wouldn't pick up and track. But, you know, this, the same issue would arise under 1503, which likewise refers to obstruct, influence, or impede. You haven't said anything about the surplusage arguments. Let me just ask you a question or two about that. Uh, suppose someone commits conduct that falls squarely within 1512D, the person intentionally harasses another person uh, and therefore per dissuades that person from attending or testifying in an official proceeding. So you've got a square, you know, a clear violation of 1512D, punishable by no more than three years in prison. But when Congress added 1512C2, which seems to cover exactly that conduct. Hi, it's Paul. So it's funny because everyone else, uh, we're like, you can I like how clear she is, but I understand what you mean. There's it's a, a little hard to listen to. I like her command of the subject. Require the intent to obstruct. And so the effect of the defendant's harassment action is to prevent the testimony 
or the production of the document, but the government has not read that statute to require an actual intent to obstruct, which I think means there are certain factual scenarios where the government might be able to prove a 1512D offense without satisfying C2. But I do want to be responsive to the broader concern that there's something anomalous about the 20-year penalty here. Let me say at the outset that no matter which statute the, the government charges, under, with respect to all of the relevant obstruction statutes here, they would be funneled through the same sentencing guideline. So the charging decision wouldn't make a difference with respect to the sentencing range. And the concern you have with the hypothetical arises equally on petitioner's reading, because so too, everything that would be covered in 1512D falls within his evidence impairment limitation. So I don't think the existence of a statutory max when there's no mandatory minimum should drive intuitions about how to interpret this provision. Well, I'm not sure that's the correct interpretation of, of subsection D. One, uh, how about 1512B, which also has a 20-year penalty, but it seems to be completely subsumed by C2. I think there is a lot of overlap between B and C. I, I don't deny that. Um, again, that would be true on either reading because B is paradigmatic witness tampering. And so even on petitioner's understanding of the statute, there would be equal duplication there. What I would say is there's no actual superfluity because there are ways of violating B that wouldn't fall within our understanding of C2, including acting in a misleading manner towards someone, which wouldn't necessarily satisfy a corrupt intent definition. Really, you think you could knowingly threaten uh, or uh, corruptly persuade, uh, corruptly mislead someone? I, I don't understand that argument. So my recollection is that there are multiple different means of carrying out that offense. Of course, something like threatening or corruptly persuading, that's the kind of duplication I was referring to earlier. But another way you can violate B is through intentionally misleading someone. That wouldn't necessarily require corrupt intent. Okay, thank you. Just oh, uh, sorry, Wait, one, more, oh, sorry. one more question. Um, I was struck by the, uh, the contrast between your argument here that the court should read in a minimal exception with the argument that you made earlier this term in... Oh, now I can't Georgia unhear it. Louis <laughs> Thanks, was, uh, Paul. ...was whether uh, an adverse employment action has to be significant or not. And you said, no, it doesn't have to be significant because, quote, the text likewise admits of no distinction between discrimination that results in a significant or insignificant disadvantage. So in Muldrow, you told us, no, don't read in an atextual uh, requirement of significance. But here you seem to be arguing, yes, you've got to read in an atextual requirement of something that's more than minimal. No, that is not our argument here. We are grounding this in the text. So we're not suggesting that there's a basic de minimis principle that applies throughout all the various legal uh, statutes that are out there, not anything well, like that. I think I might Instead, agree we with you. We this in a particular understanding of what it means to obstruct and what that word conveys. Thank you. Justice She's like the smart version. I know the Rich case because I decided it. However, the tip cases, are they in your briefs? We cite Ehrensfeld. That's the case where a subject of a grand jury investigation was tipped off about the existence of the investigation, but there was no, you know, kind of material impact or, or clear evidence of, of impairment of the evidence or availability of testimony or physical documents. And there are a number of cases in that line, including, I don't think we specifically cited, but it includes the disclosing the identity of an undercover officer. Uh, where do I find those? We would be happy to supply additional citations if you're looking for them. I believe that the D.C. Circuit decision as well cited a range of C2 cases and made clear that they didn't cover evidence impairment. Thank you. Justice Kagan? Uh, Mr. Green referred a few times to 1519 and basically said, well, that's supposed to be the catch-all provision, the omnibus provision. You know, why are you asking 1512 to do the same thing that 1519 is supposed to do? So that's one question I have for you. And the other question I have is just you've referred a number of times to yes, other Yes, she is the government lawyer. 1503, 1505. What's the tax one? 70? 7212. 26 USC 7212. If, if we go down Mr. Green's road in terms of importing um, other limits from other places in the statute, are any of those likely – to be challenged uh, uh, in the same kind of way, or are they written sufficiently differently so that we wouldn't have to worry about that? 
So let me take the questions in order. With respect to petitioner's reliance on 1519 as the catch-all here, I understood the court's decision in Yates to say precisely the opposite. In fact, Yates drew a direct comparison between 1519 on the one hand, which it said was a more narrow obstruction provision based on some of the contextual clues there, and 1512C1 on the other hand, which has the phrase record, document, or other object, and said, well, that's the broad obstruction provision. That's the one that's intended to be codified in this broader prohibition that's aimed at official proceedings, and that C1 language is actually quite broader and would scoop up the entire world of physical objects in contrast to the narrowing interpretation the court accepted in Yates. So I don't think the idea that 1519 was the broad catch-all can in any way be squared with what that statute says or how this court interpreted it in Yates. And instead, I think that the, the example to draw from Yates or the lesson to learn from it is that this court recognized that Congress was plugging the specific hole in the Enron scandal, and it did so with overlapping provisions, 1512 C1 and 1519, but it was 1512 that the court pointed to as the place where you would sensibly locate this broader provision that aims at the full range of obstructive acts to catch the known unknowns. With respect to the question, I'm sorry, now I'm forgetting the second question, oh, about the other statutes and whether they would be endangered. Um, I would be concerned about that. I'm sure defendants would try to make arguments. The language, the verb phrase is exactly the same or in different order sometimes, but it obstructs, influences, or impedes. And so the relevant verbs in the actus reus would be similar. There are different direct objects there. For example, in 1503, it's the due administration of justice. In 1505, it's the administration of the power of Congress's inquiry and investigation. But it's not clear to me whether, the, whether defendants might seek to try to now artificially limit those those clauses beyond their plain terms, even though these kinds of provisions have been in the obstruction law, I think it traces all the no, way back to No, no, I think you're, you're and calling, and calling balls and strikes. That's that all right. That's allowed. ...to evidence impairment or anything else. Thank you. Ms. Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh? I think the key uh, word in the, is otherwise, and trying to figure out what that means under our established principles of statutory interpretation, it would seem to trigger a justum generis under the Begay precedent, and um, you've used the phrase a few times, catch-all provision, as does your brief. And <clears throat> Scalia Garner book describes justum generis as uh, how you interpret catch-all provisions. Um, so I'm does justum generis apply here or not? No, we don't think it can sensibly apply here. So the court has said many times that otherwise is a natural way for Congress to create a broad catch-all category. And I certainly don't dispute that there can be situations where you have a parallel list of nouns or a parallel list of verbs where the court might further think that justum generis principles apply. But that's just not how 1512C is structured. It has, as I've mentioned, its own complex internal structure. You know, you've got the mens rea requirement that's unique to C1 and Congress did not transplant that into C2, that triggers the other canon that when Congress uses disparate language in two adjacent provisions, usually it means something by that. So I think that this just isn't the kind of situation where the court could sensibly apply usedom generis. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, if the court goes down the road of trying to glean some kind of requirement from C1, the other reason the canon is inapplicable here is that it's not evident on its face what the common attribute Ooh, would be. And, and that's, that's really the way to do it. As, as you know, <laughs> what a way to start the day. Case, and, the, and the treatise explains that as well, which is it's hard sometimes to figure out what the common link among the words in the in the phrase is. So that's, I don't think that distinct, that point I don't think distinguishes this case from other justum generis cases, but you can respond to that. But I do think that a plain speaker of English would recognize that usually the common link or the connective tissue is the language that follows the word otherwise. That's the congressionally approved similarity. That's what C1 and C2 have in common. They both relate to obstructing an official proceeding. And, you know, I, I recognize that Petitioner has invoked Begay. Your question touched on it. But the statute in Begay, which we think is not the model of, of statutory interpretation to follow here, the statute itself was, was relevantly different. It had a list of nouns, and so it was the kind of statute where potentially a justum generis could apply. What about the contextual points, a couple of them that I think have come up, but I just want to make sure you have a chance to respond that it would be odd to have such a broad provision tucked in uh, and connected by the word otherwise. Um. 
I don't think that the placement in the statute is odd at all for a couple of different reasons. One is the point I was trying to make to Justice Kagan about this court's own recognition that 1512 is one of the big obstruction statutes. This is the statute that is aimed to rise and grind those beans, Paul. And there are other provisions like 1519 and some of the ones that come right before it that are more narrowly confined and are intended to reflect discrete circumstances. That doesn't describe 1512 at all. So when Congress was trying to broadly prohibit obstruction of official proceedings, 1512 was exactly the right place to go. Then petitioner says, well, Congress buried it in the middle of the, of the statute. But I, I think it's actually quite explicable when you look at how the other provisions are structured. 1512D, which I was discussing with Justice Alito, has a much more minimal penalty and doesn't require the- Hey, Tom. To Good so to see you, as always. No court, problem. But also after you know me. A, which is the most I'm appreciative of anybody witness, dropping by. by 30 years Thank you. Uh, last question. There's six other counts in the indictment here, which um, include civil disorder, uh, physical contact with uh, the victim, assault, uh, uh, entering and remaining in a restricted building, disorderly and disruptive conduct, disorderly conduct in the Capitol building. And why aren't those six counts good enough just uh, from the Justice Department. Because those counts Welcome don't believe to the, the show. culpability of petitioner's conduct on January 6th. Those counts do not require that petitioner have acted corruptly to obstruct an yes. official proceeding. And obviously, Tom, you are the king of the algorithm. I love you. To hold him accountable for. But one of the distinct strands of harm, one of the, the, the root um, problems with petitioner's conduct is that he knew about that proceeding. He had said in advance of January 6th that he was prepared to storm the Capitol, prepared to use violence. He wanted to intimidate Congress. He said they can't vote if they can't breathe. And then he went to the Capitol on January 6th with that intent in mind and took the action, including a, assaulting low. a law enforcement officer Sorry. that Basically. did impede the ability of the officers to regain control of the Capitol and let Congress finish its work in that session. And I think it is entirely appropriate for the government to seek to hold petitioner accountable for that conduct with that intent. And are the sentences, um, the sentence available is longer for this count than for any of the other counts or all of them together? The statutory maximum is higher, but after a recent decision in the D.C. Circuit, which held that a particular sentencing enhancement doesn't apply, that was the Brock case, I believe the sentencing range, the guidelines range for the assault count, would actually be a higher guidelines range. And just to give you a sense for a typical January 6th defendant, someone who doesn't have a prior criminal history and who committed violent conduct at the Capitol, accepting responsibility, I think the average guidelines range or, or the range that would yield is 10 to 16 months of imprisonment. For someone who didn't commit violence, it would be six to 12 months of imprisonment. We've looked at the average sentences here. There are about 50 that have gone to sentencing, conviction and sentencing on just a 1512C2 is the only felony. So I think that's the best way to gauge it. This was when the sentencing enhancement did apply. So the ranges were higher. The average sentence among the approximately 50 people is 26 months of imprisonment and the median has been 24 months. So there's, there's no reasonable argument to be made that the statutory maximum here is driving anything with respect to sentencing. Thank you. Mrs. Barrett. General, I want to ask a clarifying question about the distinction in the government's charging decisions between C1 and C2. Actually, let me make that stronger, not charging decisions, like what you could charge under the statute. So as you pointed out to Justice Kavanaugh just now, you know, C1 has this additional mens rea requirement, but, you know, there is overlap if you read otherwise obstructs, influences, et cetera. Broadly, it would encompass, you know, frankly, even on the other reading, it would encompass things like alters, destroys, mutilates, etc. But you wouldn't have to prove the extra mens rea. I thought I heard you say, and I just want to clarify to Justice Jackson earlier in the argument, that the government could not charge an alteration, mutilation, concealing um, a document or physical object under C2. Am I that's correct. We usually charge the specific paragraph, and so if the conduct fits within C1, we would charge it under C1, and that would be the proper place to locate the charge. And is that 
charging? Is that prosecutorial discretion, or do you think the statute would permit you to charge it under C2, thereby escaping the specific intent requirement? Well, let me say that there is a specific intent requirement under C2, so there's no distinction but between them in that regard. Right, it's the intent yeah. to obstruct the official proceeding. So you're right that we wouldn't have to prove intent to, you know, mutilate a document or something, but we'd, we would still have to show the intent to obstruct the proceeding. You know, this is pressing on, honestly, what's a difficult question about means versus elements, and I think the best look at, the best reading of the statute is that these are different elements because they have these different actus rei, they have the different mens rea requirement, uh, the mens rea requirement that's specific to C1. They each independently prohibit attempts, but th it's, a, it's a hard question ultimately. And if we charged under the wrong paragraph accidentally, I think we could usually say that that was harmless error or else recharge under the correct paragraph. Okay, let me ask you a question that kind of gets at some of the same points that Justice Alito's questions were getting at. So what if on January 6th the Capitol itself had not been breached, the protest is going on outside the Capitol, stop the steal, stop the seal, police are, you know, in megaphones saying disperse, disperse, they're too close to the Capitol, their goal is to impair, impede, stop the proceeding, stop the counting of votes, does that violate the statute in your view under this impede language? So I think, I think that one relevant question would be whether we could satisfy the nexus requirement and show that actually the natural and probable effect of that conduct would be to have some effect on what's going on in the Capitol and yes, in the so mind range. You can. Yes. Okay, so if you're can. assuming that the same thing happened where Congress had to go into recess and couldn't hold the joint session after yes. all because there was such a security risk, I think that that probably would be chargeable if we had the intent evidence. Now, as I mentioned before, even with respect to the riot that happened, which was a much more serious breach, we don't have that evidence of intent for everyone. But if we had, for example, organizers where it was absolutely clear that they were the ringleaders who had intended to obstruct and undertook the action with that specific intent and did so knowing it was wrongful, and especially Especially if they went, you know, I'm assuming you're saying they're in the unauthorized area yeah. right outside the Capitol, that is unlawful conduct committed with consciousness of wrongdoing if we have the proof of it. Let's say that I am having a hard time seeing, like, accepting your limiting construction of the verbs obstruct, influence, or impedes to have this extra element. Um, tell me why I shouldn't be concerned about the breadth of the government's reading just relying on corruptly and the nexus requirement. Should I be concerned, or, or could you just embrace it and say, yeah, there might be some as-applied First Amendment challenges or that sort of thing? I mean, can I, can I be comfortable with the breadth if that's what I think? Yes, you can be. You certainly don't have to agree with us that a de minimis hindrance wouldn't qualify. If you thought that this was unqualified and swept broadly to any kind of hindrance whatsoever, there would still be really important limits in the statute. Obviously, you'd have to have the official proceeding. Um, that's I think lieutenant the general. Could be okay. Harder to establish okay. in a circumstance where you might not think that the natural and probable <laughs> effect of the conduct is oh going to be God. to obstruct the proceeding. You'd that's have to classic. show that the defendant knew that the natural and probable effect would do that. You'd still have to show the corruptly mens rea. And as you uh, mentioned, yeah, I, I have, have a clue as to why you were late. So that save really it. That did infringe on First Amendment rights. <laughs> there would always be the backstop of an as-applied constitutional challenge. Do you think it's plausible that Congress would have written the statute that broadly? I mean, let's say that I think that Justice Alito's example of the protesters in the courtroom, you know, yeah. it's, it's let's say it, it's corrupt it, and it impedes the proceeding because we have to go off the bench and things are stopped. Let's say I think that that's in covered by the word impedes and let's there's the nexus and it's corruptly is it plausible to think Congress wrote a statute that would sweep that in? Yes, I think that there are a lot of legitimate ways to, to try to voice your dissent if you disagree with what the court is doing, but one of the ways you cannot do it is come into this courtroom, halt the proceedings, force the justices to leave the bench, and do it with the intent and the corrupt mens rea. I think that Congress could think that is a severe intrusion on the functioning of our government and want to protect yeah, against so that. I've heard. And again, the 20 year statutory max, of course, is just a max. There's no mandatory minimum. So Congress would have recognized that sentencing courts would use their discretion to tailor the actual sentence to the facts of that specific offense. Thank you. Justice Jackson? So you've emphasized um, several times that Congress wasn't writing on a blank slate in 1512C, um, but do you dispute that it was writing uh, against the backdrop of a real-world context? Um, it was in the wake of Enron. There was document destruction. Um, and, you know, there was nothing, as far as I can tell, in the enactment history as it was recorded that suggests that Congress was thinking about 
obstruction more generally. They had this particular problem, and it was destruction of information that would have could have otherwise been used in an official proceeding. So can you just give us a little bit more as to why we shouldn't think of this as being a narrower set of circumstances to which this text relates? Sure. And, you know, I'd start by saying that we, of course, acknowledge that the immediate impetus for adding 1512 to the statute was to close the Enron loophole. It was a, a glaring loophole in the coverage of the obstruction laws that it wasn't a crime for you personally to destroy the document, and the government had to charge people for instead persuading other people to destroy documents. So that was front of mind for Congress, and Congress wanted to address it. It did address it with C-1 and with 1519 separate. But I think the best way to look at what Congress was doing in light of that context is to consider the fact that Congress went further and enacted C-2. The broader lesson Congress took away from Enron is that when you set out in advance to try to enumerate all the various ways that official proceedings can be obstructed, things will slip through the cracks. You can't Let me just ask you this. Was C-2 enacted at the same time as C-1? Yes, it was. And so why couldn't the broadening relate to other ways in which one might prevent a proceeding from accessing information. So one is documents, records, and other objects, but the known unknown, we don't know, you know, uh, could it be intangible, for example, that C2 is sort of getting at when one gets at physical objects? I guess I'm struggling with leaping from what's happening in one in the context in which it was actually enacted to all of obstruction in any form. So I, I think the reason why we wouldn't suggest that the context could bear that narrower reading is because of the actual language that Congress used. If it was really just worried about other kinds of record-based, proceeding-based, evidence-based ways of obstructing, then there were easy templates to add that in as a residual clause to C-1. There was no need to have this entirely separately numbered prohibition, and especially there was no need to use the well-recognized verb phrase obstructs, influences, or impedes, which was clearly drawn from these other omnibus, omnibus clauses that sweep more broadly. So I think, it, it, you know, we think that it's perfectly consistent with the statutory history here to recognize that after Enron, what Congress thought is, we don't want novel ways that we aren't thinking about of obstructing a proceeding to not be a crime. We do want to cover the waterfront of obstructive conduct with the backstop of a corruptly mens rea, the limitation to an official proceeding, and so forth. And that's exactly what the words of the statute say. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Rebuttal, Mr. Green? Justice Sotomayor, um, a defendant who tips off a uh, grand jury witness or tips off uh, the targets of a search warrant is someone who is certainly attempting to impair the integrity or the availability of evidence and would be covered by C2, just as somebody who creates a document and then that document is shown to counsel, and counsel withdraws a mandamus petition, has in fact created something that has caused an interference with an official proceeding. I heard my friend say twice in response to your questions, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Barrett, that C2 would cover peaceful protests as long as she could demonstrate or the government could demonstrate that there was the adequate mens rea and a nexus. As to Nexus, let's look at what uh, 1512F says. For the purposes of this section, an official proceeding need not be pending or about to be instituted at the time of the offense. There is no Nexus. Congress has written it out of the statute right there. If the J6 defendants came on January 5th and did all the kinds of things that they did, Maybe um, one would hope, but if it had happened that way, it would still be a C2 violation. With respect to the corruptly mens rea, Justice Kavanaugh, you asked a question yesterday about, um, about the fact that mens rea as a break only works at trial because the government's allegations are taken as true at the motion to dismiss stage. And I, I think that's exactly right. And that's why it's not a break at all. Or if it's any kind of break, it's a break on a, on a, on a go-kart. It's a wooden stick. What it means is that people like Mr. Fisher have to sit and go to trial and seek to um, uh, 
to, to win on a Rule 29 motion because the government hasn't proved their mens rea. The same is true of First, First Amendment defenses. If peace, peaceful protesters are and charged with C2. This morning, Paul, that my friend the referred to 1503 and yet. 1505, other statutes within, and a number of the justices have pointed out that there are much lower penalties for significant crimes. I would point the court to 1752, which is civil disobedience in a restricted space, which is what Mr. Fisher is charged with. That's a misdemeanor. If you cause substantial bodily injury, that is a 10-year, a 10-year maximum penalty. The government wants to unleash a 20-year maximum penalty on potential peaceful protests. That in and of itself is a bad idea because it's going to chill protected activities. People are going to worry about the kinds of protests they engage in, even if they're peaceful, uh, because the government has this weapon. Uh, finally, uh, I think we haven't touched very much on the breadth of influence because that's one of the uh, words that's used in C-1-2. And that would all, not only would it be peaceful protest, it could be advocacy, um, it, it could be all kinds of lobbying. Those things would be covered as well, we, we've pointed out um, in our briefs. Um, and finally, I would say to the court, let's not forget that civil proceedings are covered here. We, we would submit civil evidentiary proceedings, but civil proceedings. So the government is suggesting that the court should unleash a 20-year obstruction, maximum obstruction statute on civil litigation in federal courts. I submit that that is, and we would submit, that that is a very serious tool to put in the hands of prosecutors. We urge that the court reverse the D.C. Circuit. Thank you, counsel. The case right. is submitted. Um, what, um, hold on. The Honorable Court is now adjourned be until be tomorrow be 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 at be 10 o'clock. Okay. Hold on. Okay. I literally just put peppermint candy in my mouth. Um, let me come back here. Okay. I'll turn myself up a little bit. Okay, well... His rebuttal sounded like a threat. So this was an interesting argument. There was a lot of twists and turns in this argument. Yeah, definitely. Hi, peace, love. How are you? Good to see you. Good morning. Yeah, which case was that, Pert? I don't, I don't recall which one you're talking about. Which one was that? I don't, I don't, re I don't recall which one that was. And um, I didn't watch whatever. Um, uh, if they had arguments last week, I didn't watch it, but he did make a reference to one of the cases. And, uh, I was kind of curious about that. I was kind of curious. I think I might, um, read a document or two to end the stream. Um, but yeah, that's, a, it's, it's interesting. And I just want to say, you know, I... I think it is going to take all of us to win, not win, but I think it's going to take all of us to uh, combat the fascism and the authoritarianism that's coming our way. And so, you know, I send love out to all the protesters, all the resistors, um, you know, even if, if at times we don't all get along. Uh, I still support what you're doing. So I just want to say that because um, I think it's important. I think it's important to be that kind of person. Anyway, so uh, yeah, let me see if I can transition to some documents and go from there. Um, wait, 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 wait. Um, so I, yeah, I'm going to transition to some documents. So that was interesting. I don't really know what to make of it. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not really sure whose argument won the day because I think this is a little bit above my mental pay grade when it comes to the arguments that are, you know, the fine points of the arguments. So I always welcome. Oh, it was yesterday. Oh, I thought they said something about last Friday. I, I guess I was wrong. 
Yeah. Two inch diameter. Oh, your crab cakes. That's good. I mean, I didn't get the sense that the um, argument for the J6er Fisher, I guess is his name. I didn't get the sense that uh, he could. Um, I didn't get the sense that that the, the argument for Fisher was very powerful, right? So I didn't really understand. Um, but I, again, this is where the nuance of those arguments are, are something that I don't necessarily, I don't understand that all the nuances behind it. So I don't pretend to <laughs> try and understand. McKesson v. Doe. Okay. Yeah, hence why Terrio's. Mm -hmm. Is Terrio's um, prosecution hinging on obstructing an official proceeding? I thought it was more on conspiracy. Seditious conspiracy. Or is that what all the seditious conspiracy is hinging on? Is all of the seditious conspiracy hinging on um, obstructing an official proceeding? I don't know. <sighs> ah, me. It's not easy being green. Um, yeah, I want crab cakes. It's a little early for crab cakes. I guess you could do like a crab cake Benedict, but you're not supposed to eat runny eggs right now. So no, no eggs Benedict for you. No soup for you. Okay. Let me get us into a, uh, into a reading mode and see where we go from there. All right. Hold on. Oh, nope. Nope. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, my mic keeps going out in, in my ear anyway. Uh, let's see here. Bum, bum, bum. I didn't want that. Why did I do that? Oh, I want my bookmarks. I want my bookmarks. Primary sources. What was this? God, I don't like that. Just show it to me. God damn it. <laughs> Hope inside of him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, this one I want to read. And I want to finish reading the other thing. Uh oh. Where'd it go? Oh, shoot. oh it's in the Florida. It's in the Florida case. Bookmark folder. Yeah, bookmark folder. I should probably finish reading that first. One at a time, girl. One at a time. Bird flu, yeah. You can, oh, I'm sorry, Pepper. I should have explained that. Yep, I know. Fucking bird flu. And, uh, and, uh, undercooked meat? Because it can be, I don't know. I, I should find an official source before I start spouting medical advice here, which I'm not going to do. This is not a medical advice show. But you should be aware and, and do some research on your own about bird flu because apparently it does happen. And I, I do know for a fact you shouldn't be eating an uh, undercooked egg right now. So there's that. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I know what I was going to say. Uh. Okay. Ta-da! Oh, I should close my bookmark window. You should close your bookmark window, lady. Everybody can see your bookmarks. <laughs> we read part of this yesterday. So I really am not going to read it again. Um, let me see what's going on over here. Uh, was it Gorsuch that mes mentioned pulling the fire alarm a lot? Uh, before a vote. I don't know. I can't remember who it was, but boy, they were harping on it. It might have been. 
It kind of sounded like him. It didn't sound like Kavanaugh. And it didn't really sound like... Um, it didn't sound like Kavanaugh. It sounded more like Gorsuch. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, I got a message around um, there's other underlying crimes if this one is taken away. Is there, though, for people like Enrique Tario and the other guys who were brought up on seditious conspiracy, does that hinge on the obstruction charge? I'm just curious. I mean, I can imagine it's not positive if if one is not able to include the obstruction charge in anyone's you know, given the, if there's evidence of intent or whatever, you know, however the legal standard needs to be for that, that makes sense. But I'm not sure. Yeah, it just isn't, I'm not sure about that. I know, Rep Bowman, I know that. Teresa, you're right. He's trying to invoke some kind of retribution on Jamal Bowman for pulling the fire alarm or whatever. So I, I can't, I can't be the one, I can't sit in judgment of that because it was a crazy day. <laughs> and yet I understand, I understand invoking it if it's factually, you know, what something blur, 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 if it, I get it, but I don't think it's equivalent. I think context matters. Wouldn't it matter? Wouldn't context matter as much as, like, wouldn't, well, never mind. I'm not going to argue the Jamal Bowman pulling of the fire alarm. He could have been. I have no idea what was in his mind about that. So and that to me is a shiny object that they want us to focus on. And I refuse to play that game. Tina is definitely overhead. One of the joys of living in uh, the East, in East Hollywood. Oops, something in my eye. Hold on. Um... But yeah. <laughs> oh, Tina. Remember the 60s. Trump would make that worse. Oh my gosh. Easily. There's so much damage that could be done by this man and his little band of merry men, right? It's not just, it's not really him except for the fact that he's self-serving and, and there's no bottom. That is definitely him. But, all right, where did I... Where do I belong? Uh, I think we, yeah, it is things. And, and I don't, I'm not saying context, you know, like forgive one, but don't forgive the other. I'm never, you know, that's not, that's not really, it's a, it's a Solomon level decision, I guess, <laughs> or there's evidence one way or the other. I don't know, but not something I feel prepared to litigate in my head. Because to me, it's just distracting from the larger issue at hand, which is we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. I don't... Okay, this was that. Okay, I think I really... I think we... we yeah, let's just go here. Number two. The court should deny the defendant's request. The court has already considered and rejected the defendant's arguments. Their motion is therefore tantamount to a motion for reconsideration, which should be denied. The procedural history alone is sufficient grounds for denial. Defendants have known since this case was charged that they would need to file a SIPA Section 5 notice. As of November 2, 2023, they had nearly all classified discovery produced to date, an imminent SIPA 5 Section 5 deadline, sorry, and an imminent expert witness disclosure deadline. Oh, we did read this. And they have had access to the government's expert disclosure since the beginning of this year. It is true that the defendants must access that submission in a skiff, but they have already had three months to do so. I think this is a good thing to read against. Uh, again, <laughs> which is more than adequate time. In fact, the court's July scheduling order set the defense expert disclosure deadline one week after the government's. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we did read that. I don't want to revisit the past. Uh, 
Mm -mm. Oh, this we might not have. Okay, that we probably read, I think. Oh, that, okay, well, we're almost done with this. The cases in which the 11th Circuit or predecessor Fifth Circuit had found has found violations of the right to counsel or inadequate time to prepare present present sharply different facts. One is thirty four days between arraignment and trial insufficient to prepare. Uh, at a docket call trial set for following day when counsel was unavailable for the second day of trial court denied motion for continuance resulting in counsel who was unfamiliar with the case representing defendant. Well, those are pretty clear cut. Simply put, there is no support for what is sought here, an indeterminate continuance of pre-trial pre deadlines for a defendant who has already had months to prepare and meet those deadlines and whose arguments are identical to those the court already rejected in setting the deadlines in the first place. Each time the court sets a new deadline in this case and attempts to keep it moving toward trial, the defendant reflexively asks for adjournment. That must stop. The court should deny defendant's motions to continue the May 9th expert witness disclosure and sip a five-section notice deadlines. Dang it. I submit this. I'm Jack Smith. Damn it. That's right. I'm Jack Smith. Whoops. Okay. I, I found this article, and I just, I can't even stand it. I, 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 I found this article, and it just it was the picture that got me first. Because, first of all, that's a T-Rex head. So it's kind of like, you know, destiny, if you will, if you will. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, I haven't read it yet, so I apologies in advance, but this was from November 2018 uh, from The Atlantic, which I'm kind of having beef with right now because they did this puff piece on Matt Gates that had what, as one of its sources, Chuck Johnson, of all people, who is up Matt Gates's butthole and is a Nazi. I mean, he's like a fucking Holocaust denier. There's no way in polite society, someone like Chuck Johnson, who is threatening and coercive and icky, should be allowed to be a source of fucking anything. He's, he's a, a, a Walmart Ray Donovan. And he's not good at it. Yeah, I think it, you think it'll go our way. That's interesting. I hope so. I don't know. I didn't think the, I didn't think the, the MAGA attorney or whatever, J6, I'm not sure what you want to call him. I didn't think his arguments were persuasive, but again, this is probably way above my understanding of the, of the legal um, maze that they find themselves in. But I want to see what this article is all about because I'm, I'm, I've been dying to read it, but I wanted to wait until we had some chance to be. Oh, uh, 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 ah, uh. I didn't want to do that. I don't want to explore. Get away from me. The man who broke politics to read this story. Oh, no, I have to do that. Oh, my God. I hate all of this. Oh, not Walmart at the local grocer. I better go ahead and unlike sign into this. Hold on just a second. What an idiot I am. What an idiot. I don't think I... Okay, I'll start a free trial, but don't let me forget that I started a free trial. No, I'm not going to do that. Oh, my God. Maybe I have an... Do I have an account? This is terrible. Okay. All right, hold on. I don't know. Yeah, I'll do that one. whatever you need to do. Uh, 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 Used to catch blue crabs off the dock with a piece of string. That's so cool. All right. Fine, stop. Okay, now great. What? Now what? I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll do it. Ugh. I hate, I hate everybody. The eating kind. 
Okay, return. Return, return to sender. Oh my freaking God, Atlantic, I swear to God. Don't make me angry. Okay. Let's see. Do 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 do. Once they grab you, they don't let go. <laughs> I don't know. I am not really good at the whole like fishing thing. I'm not. I'm not very good at that stuff, unfortunately. Once they grab you, they don't let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know exactly what to do. South Carolina. That sounds cool. I don't think I've spent a lot of time in South Carolina. I spent some I spent a lot of time in North Carolina. But not South Carolina. But I've heard great things about it. Um okay, let's read about Newt. Newt the snoot. Newt the... Give Newt the boot. Ooh, ah, ah! Weed pen down. <laughs> Nobody panic. Nobody panic. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. I gotta pick up my weed pen. Come back, little Sheba. Come back. Where the hell did you fly off to? This is unbelievable. Oh, there you are. Phew. That was a close one. Okay, hold on. All right, we ready, kids? Jim, hello. Remember when they tried to tell us insurrectionists were tourists just sticking to peaceful? <laughs> uh, remember when they conflated all kinds of details and none of them ended up being true in in total in some? Oh yeah, that was like every one of them. Oh, I bet that's so nice, Siegfried. That sounds so nice. I went to Savannah once. I really liked that. That was really beautiful. That was fun. But I can imagine it might be funner to be a tourist there than maybe it's not as fun to live there with everyone who comes through and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I miss the, I miss the East Coast kind of vibe. I mean, I actually love Southern, Southern California. I like Northern California too. But I actually like the southern vibe I, and the east coast vibe. I don't know. I'm fine anywhere. I went to Missouri, you know, like at family reunions and stuff. I loved it. I thought it was beautiful. Rolling hills. I thought it was gorgeous. Out in the country. Peaceful tourists wearing tactical costumes, <laughs> helmets, and carrying bear spray and zip ties and spears on the end of their flags. I know. I can imagine. It's not, it's been a long time. Oh my gosh. I haven't been there in a long time. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. Let's just leave it at that. Um, okay. Let me read this freaking article. Newt Gingrich. I've not read this by the way, so I don't know what it's going to say, but I'm, I'm hoping it's, uh, interesting. Newt Gingrich is an important man, a man of refined taste, accustomed to a certain lifestyle. And so when he visits the zoo, let me just turn myself down a little bit. He does not merely stand with all the other patrons to look at the tortoises. He goes inside the tank. On this particular afternoon in late March, I apologize for all these fucking ads. Uh, the former Speaker of the House can be found shuffling giddily around a damp 90 degree enclosure at the Philadelphia Zoo. A rumpled suit draped over his elef elephantine, ele elephantine, elephantine frame, plastic booties wrapped around his feet as he tickles and strokes and paws at the giant shelled reptiles, declaring them, quote, very cool. It's a weird, stop it. It's a weird scene, and after a few minutes, onlookers begin to gather on the other side of the glass, craning their necks and snapping pictures with their phones and asking each other, is that who I think it is? The attention would be enough to make a lesser man, say, a sweaty magazine writer who followed his subject into the tortoise tank for reasons that are now escaping him, grow self-conscious. 
but Gingrich, for whom all of this is rather all of this rather closely approximates a natural habitat, barely seems to notice. A well-known animal fanatic, Gingrich was the one who suggested we meet at the Philadelphia Zoo. He used to come here as a kid and has fond memories of family picnics on warm afternoons, gazing up at the giraffes and rhinos and dreaming of one day becoming a zookeeper. But we aren't here just for the nostalgia. There is, he explained soon after arriving, a lot we can learn from the natural world. Since then, Gingrich has spent much of the day using zoo animals to teach me about politics and human affairs. In the reptile room, I learned that the evolutionary stability of the crocodile, 90 million years and they haven't changed much, illustrates the folly of pursuing change for its own sake. Quote, if you're doing something right, keep doing it. Outside the lion pen, Gingrich treats me to a brief discourse on gender theory. Quote, the male lion procreates, protects the pride, and sleeps. The females hunt, and as soon as they find something, the male knocks them over and takes the best portion. It's the opposite of every American feminist vision of the world, but it's a fact. But the most important lesson comes as we wander through Monkey Junction. Gingrich tells me about one of his favorite books, Chimpanzee Politics, in which the primatologist Franz de Waal documents the complex rivalries and coalitions that govern communities of chimps. Duval's theory, thesis rather, is that human politics, in all its brutality and ugliness, is part of an evolutionary heritage we share with our close relatives, and Gingrich clearly agrees. For several minutes, he lectures me about the perils of failing to understand the animal kingdom. Disney, he says, has done us a disservice with whitewashed movies like The Lion King, in which friendly jungle cats get along with their zebra neighbors instead of attacking them and devouring their carcasses. And for all the famous feel-good photos of Jane Goodall interacting with chimps in the wild, he tells me, her later work showed that she was horrified to find her beloved creatures killing one another for sport and feasting on baby chimps. It is crucial, Gingrich says, that we humans see the animal kingdom from which we evolved for what it really is, a very competitive, challenging world at every level. As he pauses to catch his breath, I peer out over the sprawling primate reserve. Spider monkeys swing wildly from bar to bar on an elaborate jungle gym, while black and white lemurs leap and tumble over one another, and a hulking gorilla grunts in the distance. At a loss for what to say, I start to mutter something about the viciousness of the animal world, but Gingrich cuts me off. It's not viciousness, he corrects me, his voice suddenly stern. It's natural. There's something about Newt Gingrich that seems to capture the spirit of America circa 2018. With his immense head and white mop of hair, his cold, boyish grin, and his high, raspy voice, he has the air of a late Empire Roman senator, senator a walking bundle of appetites and excesses and hubris and wit. In conversation, he toggles unnervingly between grandiose pronouncements about Western civilization and partisan cheap shots that seem tailored for cable news. It's a combination of self-righteousness and smallness, of pomposity and pettiness that personifies the decadence of this era. In the clamorous story of Donald Trump's Washington, it would be easy to mistake Gingrich for a minor character. A loyal Trump ally in 2016, Gingrich forwent a high-powered post in the administration and has instead spent the years since the election cashing in on his access, churning out books, three Trump, is this hagiographies, hagiographies, I'm not really sure, one spy thriller, working the speaking circuit where he commands as much as 75000 per talk for his insights on the president, and popping up on Fox News as a paid contributor. He spends much of his time in Rome, where his wife, Callista, serves as Trump's ambassador to the Vatican, and where he likes to boast, we have yet to find a bad restaurant. But few figures in modern history have done more than Gingrich to lay the groundwork for Trump's rise. During his two decades in Congress, he pioneered a style of partisan combat, replete with name-calling, conspiracy theories, and strategic obstructionism, that poisoned American's political culture and plunged Washington into permanent dysfunction. Gingrich's career can perhaps be best understood as a grand exercise in devolution, an effort to strip American politics of the civilizing traits it had developed over time 
and return it to its most primal essence. When I ask him how he views his legacy, Gingrich takes me on a tour of the Western world gripped by crisis. In Washington, chaos reigns as institutional authority crumbles. Throughout America, right-wing Trumpites excuse me, and left-wing resistors are treating midterm races like calamitous fronts in a civil war that must be won at all costs. And in Europe, populist revolts are wreaking havoc in capitals across the continent. 25 years after engineering the Republican Revo Revolution, Gingrich can draw a direct line from his work in Congress to the upheaval now taking place around the globe. But as he surveys the wreckage of the modern political landscape, he is not regretful, he's gleeful. The old order is dying, he tells me. Almost everywhere you have freedom, you have a very deep discontent that the system isn't working. And that's a good thing, I ask. It's essential, he says, if you want Western civilization to survive. Oh my God, that was pre ozempic I'm pretty sure. Uh, that's right, March 2018, I guess he was at the zoo with this guy. Oh my goodness. On June 24th, 1978, Gingrich stood to address a gathering of college Republicans at a Holiday Inn near the Atlanta airport. It was a natural audience for him. At 35, he was more youthful looking than the average congressional candidate with fashionably robust sideburns and a cool professor charisma that had made him one of the more popular faculty members at West Georgia College. But Gingrich had not come to deliver an academic lecture to the young activists before him. He had come to foment revolution. One of the great problems we have in the Republican Party is that we don't encourage you to be nasty, he told the group. We encourage you to be neat, obedient, and loyal, and faithful, and all those Boy Scout words which would be great around the campfire, but are lousy in politics. For their party to succeed, Gingrich went on, the next generation of Republicans would have to learn to raise hell and stop being so nice, to realize that politics was, above all, a cutthroat war for power, and to start acting like it. The speech received little attention at the time. Gingrich was, after all, an obscure, untenured professor whose political experience consisted of two failed congressional bids. But when, a few months later, he was finally elected to the House of Representatives on his third try, he went to Washington, a man obsessed with becoming the kind of leader he had described that day in Atlanta. The GOP was then at, at its lowest point in modern history. <laughs> oh no, honey, it went lower. <laughs> I got news for you. Score, <laughs> speaking from the future, scores of Republican lawmakers had been wiped out in the aftermath of Watergate and those who'd survived seemed to Gingrich sadly resigned to a permanent minority mindset. It was like death, he recalls of the mood in the caucus. They were morally and psychologically shattered. But Gingrich had a plan. The way he saw it, Republicans would never be able to take back the House as long as they kept compromising with the Democrats out of some high-minded civic desire to keep congressional business humming along. His strategy was to blow up the bipartisan coalitions that were essential to legislating and then seize on the resulting dysfunction to wage a populist crusade against the institution of Congress itself. His idea, says Norm Ornstein, a political scientist who knew Gingrich at the time, was to build toward a national election where people were so disgusted by Washington and the way it was operating that they would throw, out, they would throw the ins out and bring the outs in. Gingrich recruited a cadre of young bomb throwers, a group of 12 congressmen he christened the Conservative Opportunity Society, and together they stalked the halls of Capitol Hill, searching for trouble in TV cameras. Their emergence was not, at first, greeted with enthusiasm by the cameras. Their emergence was not, oh, by the, excuse me, by the more moderate Republican leadership. They were too noisy, too brash, too hostile to the guards, old guards' cherished sense of decorum, they even look different, sporting blow-dried pompadours while their more camera-shy elders smeared brill cream on their comb-overs. Gingrich and his cohort showed little interest in legislating, a task that had heretofore been seen as the primary responsibility of elected legislators. Bob Livingston, a Louisiana Republican who had been elected to Congress a year before Gingrich, marveled at the way the hard-charging Georgian rose to prominence by ignoring the traditional path taken by new lawmakers. Quote, my idea was to work within the committee structure, take care of my district, and just pay attention to the legislative process, Livingston told me. 
but Newt came in as a revolutionary. For revolutionary purposes, the House of Representatives was less a governing body than an arena for conflict and drama, and Gingrich found ways to put on a show. He recognized an opportunity in the newly installed C-SPAN cameras and began delivering tirades against Democrats to an empty chamber, knowing that his remarks would be beamed to viewers across the country. The tiny lizard. What? You mean Newt? <laughs> oh my god. Oh yeah, yeah. As his profile grew, N Gingrich took aim at the moderates in his own party, calling Bob Dole the tax collector for the welfare state, and baited Democratic leaders with all manner of epithet and insult, pro-communist, un-American, tyrannical. In 1984, one of his floor speeches prompted a red-faced eruption from Speaker Tip O'Neill, who said of Gingrich's attacks, quote, it's the lowest thing that I've seen in my 32 years in Congress. The episode landed them both on the nightly news, and Gingrich, knowing the score, declared victory. I'm now a famous person, he gloated to the Washington Post. It's hard to overstate just how radical these actions were at the time. Although Congress had been a volatile place during periods of American history, with fistfights and canings and representatives bellowing violent threats at one another, by the middle of the 20th century, lawmakers had largely coalesced around a stabilizing set of norms and traditions. Entrenched committee chairs may have dabbled in petty corruption, and Democratic leaders may have pushed around the Republican minority when they were in a pinch, but as a rule, comedy reigned. Comedy? I think it's comedy. I'm sorry. Comedy reigned. Most members still believed in the idea that the framers had in mind, said, says Thomas Mann, a scholar who studies Congress. They believed in genuine deliberation and compromise, and they had institutional loyalty. This ethos was perhaps best embodied by Republican minority leader Bob Mitchell, an amiable World War II veteran known around Washington for his aversion to swearing. Doggone it and by Jiminy were fixtures of his vocabulary, as well as his penchant for carpooling and golfing with Democratic colleagues. Mitchell was no liberal, but he believed that the best way to serve conservatism and his country was by working honestly with Democratic leaders, pulling legislation inch by inch to the right when he could, and protecting the good faith that made aisle crossing possible. Gingrich was unimpressed by Mitchell's conciliatory approach. He represented a culture which, is, which has been had been defeated consistently, he recalls. More important, Gingrich inu intuited that the old dynamics that had produced public servants like Mitchell were crumbling. Tectonic shifts in American politics, particularly around issues of race and civil rights, had triggered an ideological sorting between two parties. Liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, two groups that had been well represented in Congress, were beginning to vanish, and with them the cross-party partnerships that had fostered cooperation. The polarization didn't originate with Gingrich, but he took advantage of it, as he set out to circumvent the old power structures and build his own. Rather than letting the party bosses in Washington decide which candidates deserved institutional, excuse me, institutional support, he took control of a group called GOPAC and used it to recruit and train an army of mini newts to run for office. Gingrich hustled to keep his cause and himself in the press. Quote, if you're not in the Washington Post every day, you might as well not exist, he told one reporter. His secret to capturing headlines was simple, he explained to supporters. Quote, the number one fact about the news media is they love fights. When you give them confrontations, you get attention. When you get attention, you can educate. Effective as these tactics were in the short term, they had a corrosive effect the, on the way Congress operated. Gradually, it went from legislating to the weaponization of legislating, to the permanent campaign, to the permanent campaign war, Mann says. It's like he took a wrecking ball to the most powerful and influential legislature in the world. But Gingrich looks back with pride on the transformations he set in motion. Noise become, became a proxy for status, he tells me, and no one was noisier than Newt. We are in the petting zoo, examining the goats, when Gingrich decides to tell me about the moment he first glimpsed his destiny as one of history's great men. It was 1958, and he was 15 years old. His family was visiting Verdun, a small city in northeastern France, where 300,000 people had been killed during World War I. The battlefield was still scarred by cannon fire, and young Newt spent the day wandering around, ta taking in the details. He found a rusted helmet on the ground, saw the ossuary, 
forgive me, where the bones of dead soldiers were piled high. I realized countries can die, he says, and he decided it would be up to him to make sure that America didn't. This is an important scene in the Newt Gingrich creation myth, and he has turned to it repeatedly over the years to satisfy journalists and biographers searching for a rosebud moment. But the rest of Gingrich's childhood may be just as instructive. His mother struggled with manic depression and spent much of her adult life in a fog of medication. His stepfather was a brooding, violent man who showed little affection for Nudie, the pudgy, flat-footed, bookish boy his wife had foisted upon him. Gingrich moved around a lot and had few friends his age. He spent more time alone in his room reading books about dinosaurs than he did playing with the neighborhood kids. But this is not the stuff Gingrich likes to talk about. When asked, he describes his childhood as ordinary, even idyllic, allowing only glimpses of the full picture when you press him for details. Those family picnics at the zoo that he had been reminiscing about all day, they weren't with his parents, it turns out, but his aunts, who were looking for ways to make their lonely nep nephew happy. It was Verdun that Gingrich found an identity, a sense of purpose. Quote, I decided then that I basically had three jobs, he tells me. Figure out what we had to do to survive, the we here being proponents of Western civilization, the threats being vague and unspecified. Figure out how to explain it so that the American people would give us permission, and figure out how to implement it once they gave us permission. That's what I've done since August 58. I want to read that again. Figure out how to explain it so that the American people would give us permission, and figure out how to implement it once they gave us permission. That sounds a lot like mind-fucking. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, okay. The next year, Gingrich turned in a 180-page term paper about the balance of global power and announced to his teacher that his family was moving to Georgia, where he planned to start a Republican Party in the then heavily Democratic state and get himself elected to Congress. Gingrich immersed himself in war histories and dystopian fiction and books about techno-futurism, and as the years went on, he became fixated on the idea that he was a world historic hero. He has described himself as a transformational figure and the most serious systematic revolutionary of modern times. To one reporter, he declared, I want to shift the entire planet, and I'm doing it. To another, he said, people like me are what stand between us and Auschwitz. Oh, my God. As Gingrich tells me about his epiphany in Verdun, a man in a baseball cap approaches us in full fanboy mode. Newt Gingrich, he exclaims. Good to see you, man. I love you on Fox. Thank you, Gingrich replies. Please keep watching. This has been happening all day. Fans coming up to request selfies or to shake his hand or to thank him for his work in draining the swamp. It's a reminder that to, cer to a certain swath of America, Gingrich is not some washed up partisan hack. He's a towering statesman, a visionary hero, the man he set out to be. As the superfan leaves, I make a passing observation about how many admirers Gingrich has at the zoo. I think you'd be surprised, he tells me, his voice dripping with condescension. You get outside of Washington and New York, and there are an amazing number of people who, like this who show up. By 1988, Gingrich's plan to Congress, er, conquer Congress via sabotage was well underway. As his national profile had risen, so too had, had his influence within the Republican caucus. It's a, his original quorum of twelve disciples having expanded to dozens of sharp-elbowed House conservatives who looked to him for guidance. Gingrich encouraged them, to, encouraged them to go after their enemies with catchy alliterative nicknames, Daffy Dukakis, the loony left, and schooled them in the art of partisan blood sport. Through GOPAC, he sent out cassette tapes to, and memos to Republican candidates across the country who wanted to speak like Newt, providing them with carefully honed attack lines and creating quite literally a new vocabulary for a generation of conservatives. One memo titled Language, a Key Mechanism of Control, included a list of recommended words to use in describing Democrats, sick, pathetic, lie, anti-flag, traitors, radical, corrupt. The goal was to reframe the boring policy debates in Washington as a national battle between good and evil, white hats versus black, a fight for the very soul of America. Through this prism, any news story could be turned into a wedge. Woody Allen had an affair with his partner's adoptive daughter. It fits the Democratic Party platform perfectly, Gingrich declared, 
a deranged South Carolina woman murdered her two children, a symptom of a sick society, Gingrich intoned, and the only way you can get change is to vote Republican. Oh, I don't think so. Gingrich was not above mining the darkest reaches of the, the right-wing fever swamps for material. Hold on. I've got kitties on the move. Okay, I have to move things so that nothing gets knocked over. Um, by Gus, who weighs over 18 pounds. I just want you to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a big boy. And I think he's going to get bigger too, which is amazing. Uh, Byron, because he hasn't grown into his paws yet. Do, do, where, where was I? <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> oh, when Vince Foster, a staffer in the Clinton White House, committed suicide, Gingrich publicly flirted with fringe conspiracy theories that suggested he had been assassinated. He took these things that were confined to the margins of the conservative movement and mainstreamed them, says David Brock, who worked at a, as a conservative journalist at the time, covering the various, various Clinton scandals before later becoming a Democratic operative. What I, quote, what I think he saw was the potential for using them to throw the sand in the gears of Clinton's ability to govern. I know, he's huge. I don't overfeed him, I promise. Uh, despite... <laughs> Despite his growing grassroots following, Gingrich remained unpopular among a certain contingent of congressional Republicans, who were scandalized by his tactics. But that started to change when Democrats elected Tex Texas Congressman Jim Wright as Speaker. Whereas Tip O'Neill had been known for working across party lines, Wright came off as gruff and power-hungry, and his efforts to sideline the Republican minority enraged even many of the GOP's mild-mannered moderates. People started asking, who's the meanest, nastiest son of a bitch we can get to fight back, recalls Mickey Edwards, a Republican who was then representing Oklahoma in the House. And of course, that was Newt Gingrich. Gingrich unleashed a, sh unleashed a smear campaign aimed at taking right down. He reportedly circulated unsupported rumors about a scandal involving a teenage congressional page and tried to tie right to shady foreign lobbying practices. Finally, one allegation gained traction. That, why, that Wright had to use 60000 in book royalties to evade limits on outside income. Watergate, this was not, but it was enough to force Wright's resignation and hand Gingrich the scalp he so craved. The episode cemented Gingrich's status as the de facto leader of the GOP in Washington. Heading into the 1994 midterms, he rallied Republicans around the idea of turning Election Day into a national referendum. On September 27th, more than 300 candidates gathered outside the Capitol to sign the Contract with America, a document of Gingrich's creation that outlined 10 bills Republicans promised to pass if they took control of the House. Today, on these steps, we offer this contract as a first step towards renewing American civilization, Gingrich proclaimed. While candidates fanned out across the country to campaign on the contract, Gingrich and his fellow Republican leaders in Congress held fast to their strategy of gridlock. As Election Day approached, they maneuvered to block every piece of legislation they could, even those that might ordinarily have received bipartisan support, like a lobbying reform bill, on the theory that voters would blame Democrats for the paralysis. Pundits, aghast at the brazenness of the strategy, predicted backlash from voters, but few seemed to notice. Even some Republicans were surprised by what they were getting away with. Bill Kristol, then a GOP strategist, marveled at the success of his party's principled obstructionism. An up-and-coming senator named Mitch McConnell was quoted crowing that opposing the Democrats' agenda gives gridlock a good name. When the 103rd Congress adjourned in October, the Washington Post declared it perhaps the worst Congress in 50 years. Well, the, uh, the 118th Congress says, hold my beer. Hi, Lip Roo. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, my Lord. That sounds crazy. We're reading a 2018 article from The Atlantic about how Newt Gingrich broke politics. So it's it's looking back six years. Yet Gingrich's plan worked. By the time voters went to... I Oh, I'm, you guys are talking about islands. Oh, I want to be on an island. <laughs> By the time voters went to the polls, exit surveys revealed widespread frustration with Congress and a deep appetite for change. Republicans achieved one of the most sweeping electoral victories in modern American history. They picked up 54 seats in the House and seized state legislatures and governorships across the country. For the first time in 40 years, the GOP took control of both houses of Congress. On election night, Republicans packed into a ballroom in the Atlanta suburbs, waving placards that read, Liberals, your time is up. 
and sporting Rush Limbaugh for President t-shirts. The band played Happy Days Are Here Again, and Gingrich, the next Speaker of the House, the new philosopher king of the Republican Party, took the stage to raucous cheers. With victory in hand, Gingrich did his best to play the statesman, saying he would reach out to every Democrat who wants to work with us, and promising to be Speaker of the House, not Speaker of the Republican Party. But the true spirit of the Republican Revolution was best captured by the event's MC, a local talk radio host in Atlanta who had hitched his star to the newt wagon early on. Grinning out at the audience, he announced that the package had just arrived at the White House with some Tylenol in it. President Clinton, joked Sean Hannity, was about to feel the pain. The freshman Republicans who had entered Congress in January 1995 were lawmakers created in the image of Newt, young, confrontational, and determined to inflict radical change on Washington. Gingrich encouraged this revolutionary zeal, quoting Thomas Paine, quote, We have it in our power to begin the world over again. And working to, an ins to instill a conviction among his followers that they were political gatecrashers, come to leave their dent on American history. What Gingrich didn't tell them, or perhaps refused to believe himself, was that in Congress history is seldom made without consensus building and horse trading. From the creation of the interstate highways to the passage of civil rights legislation, the most significant lasting acts of Congress have been achieved by lawmakers who deftly maneuver through the legislative process and work with members of both parties. On January 4th, Speaker Gingrich gaveled Congress into session and promptly got to work transforming America. Over the next 100 days, he and his fellow Republicans worked feverishly to pass bills with names that sounded like they'd come from Republican Mad Libs, the American Dream Restoration Act, the Taking Back Our Streets Act, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But when the dust settled, America didn't look all that different. Almost all of the House's big-ticket bills got snuffed out in the Senate or died by way of presidential veto. Huh, sounds familiar. Instead, the most enduring aspects of Gingrich's speakership would be his tactical innovations. Determined to keep Republicans in power, Gingrich reoriented the con congressional schedule around filling campaign war chests, shortening the official work week to three days so that members had time to dial for dollars. From 1994 to 1998, Republicans raised... Uh, an unprecedented $1 billion and ushered in a new era of money in politics. Gingrich's famous budget battles with Bill Clinton in 1995 gave way to another great partisan invention, the weaponized government shutdown. There had been federal funding lapses before, but they tended to be minor affairs that lasted only a day or two. Gingrich's shutdown, by contrast, furloughed hundreds of thousands of government workers for several weeks at Christmas time so Republicans could use their paychecks as a bartering chip in negotiations, negotiations with the White House. The gambit was a bust. Voters blamed the GOP for the crisis, and Gingrich was castigated in the press. But it ensured that the shutdown threat would loom over every congressional standoff from that point on. There were real accomplishments during Gingrich's speakership, too. A tax cut, a bipartisan health care deal, even a balanced federal budget— and for a time, a truly historic triumph seemed within reach. Over the course of several secret meetings at the White House in the fall of 1997, Gingrich told me he and Clinton sketched out plans for a center-right coalition that would undertake big, challenging projects, such as a wholesale reform of Social Security. But by then, the poisonous politics Gingrich had injected into Washington's, Washington's bloodstream had escaped his control. So when the stories started coming out in early 1998, the ones about the president and the intern, the cigar and the blue dress, and the party faithful were clamoring for Clinton's head on a pike, and Gingrich's acolytes in the house were stomping their feet and crying for blood, well, he knew what he had to do. This is the most systematic, deliberate obstruction of justice cover-up and effort to avoid the truth we have ever seen in American history, Gingrich declared of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, pledging that he would help keep banging the drum until Clinton was impeached. I will never again, as long as I am Speaker, make a speech without commenting on this topic. Never mind that the Republicans had no real chance of getting the impeachment through the Senate. Removing the President wasn't the point. This was an opportunity to humiliate the Democrats. Politics was a war for power, just as Gingrich had prophesied all those years ago, and he wasn't about to give up the fight. The rest is immortalized in the history books that line Gingrich's library. The GOP's impeachment, 
crusade backfired with voters. Republicans lost seat in the House, and Gingrich was driven out of his job by the same bloodthirsty brigade he'd helped elect. I'm willing to lead, he sniffed on his way out the door, but I'm not willing to preside over people who are cannibals. <laughs> oh, well, the self, the, what is that, the uh, face-eating leopards? Yeah. The great irony of Gingrich's rise and reign is that in the end, he did fundamentally transform America, just not in the ways he'd hoped, or maybe they were. He thought he was enshrining a new era of conservative government. In fact, he was enshrining an attitude, angry, combative, tribal, that would infect politics for decades to come. In the years since he left the House, Gingrich has only doubled down. When the GOP le leaders huddled at Capitol Hill uh, Steakhouse on the night of President Barack Obama's inauguration, Gingrich was there to advocate a strategy of complete obstruction. And when Senator Ted Cruz led a mob of Tea Party torchbearers in shutting down the government over Obamacare, Gingrich was there to argue that shutdowns are, quote, a normal part of the constitutional process. Mickey Edwards, the Oklahoma Republican who served in the House for 16 years, told me he believes Gingrich is responsible for turning Congress into a place where partisan allegiance is prized above all else. He noted that during Watergate, President Richard Nixon was forced to resign only because leaders of his own party broke ranks to hold him accountable, a dynamic Edwards views as impossible in the post-Gingrich era. He created a situation where you now stand with your party at all costs and at all times, no matter what, Edwards said. Our whole system in America is based on the Madisonian idea of power-checking power. Newt has been a big part of eroding that. What Bill did now send quite... Oh, I don't know. But when I ask Gingrich what he thinks of the notion that he played a part in toxifying Washington, he bristles. Quote, I took everything the Democrats had done brilliantly to dominate and taught Republicans how to do it, he tells me which made me a bad person because when Republicans dominate, it must be bad. Well, I mean, where's the lie? He adopts a sing-song whine to imitate his critics in, a, in the political establishment. Oh, the mean, nasty Republicans actually got to win, and we hate it because we're a democratic city. Our real estate's based on big government, and the value of my house will go down if they balance the budget. What? That's the heart of this. <laughs> He's weird. These days, Gingrich seems to be revising his legacy in real time, shifting the story away from the ideological sea change that his populist disruption was supposed to enable and toward the act of populist disruption itself. He places his own rise to power and Trump's in the same grand American narrative. There have been four great political waves in the half, past half century, he tells me. Goldwater, Reagan, Gingrich, then Trump. But when I press him to explain what, the, what connects those four waves philosophically, the best he can do is say they were all anti-liberal. Political scientists who study our era of extreme polarization will tell you that the driving force behind American politics today is not actually partisanship, but negative partisanship. That is, hatred of the other team more than loyalty to one's own. Gingrich's speakership was both a symptom and an accelerant of that phenomenon. On December 9, 1998, Gingrich cast his final vote as a congressman, a vote to impeach Bill Clinton for lying under oath about an affair. By the time it was revealed that the ex-speaker had been secretly carrying on an illicit relationship with a young congressional aide named Callista throughout his impeachment crusade, almost no one was surprised. This was, after all, the same man who had famously been accused by his first wife, whom he'd met as a teenager when she was his geometry teacher, of trying, oh, when he was a teenager, sorry, he'd met as a teenager, when she was his geometry teacher, okay, of trying to discuss divorce terms when she was in the hospital recovering from tumor removal surgery, the same man who for a time had re reportedly restricted his extramarital dalliances to oral sex so that he could claim he'd never slept with another woman. Gingrich declined to comment on these allegations. Crazy. Detractors could call it hypocrisy if they wanted. Gingrich might not even argue. Quote, it doesn't matter what I do, he once rationalized, according to one of his ex-wives. People need to hear what I have to say. But if he had taught America one lesson, it was that any sin could be absolved, any trespass forgiven, as long as you pick the right targets and swung at them hard enough. When Gingrich's personal life became issue during his short-lived presidential campaign in 2012, he knew just who to swing at. Asked during a primary debate about an allegation he'd requested an open marriage with his second wife, Gingrich took a deep breath, gathered all the righteous indignation he could muster, and let loose one of the most remarkable and effective non-sequiturs 
in the history of campaign rhetoric. I think the destructive, vicious, negative nature of much of the news media makes it harder to govern this country, harder to attract decent people to run for public office, and I am appalled that you would begin a presidential debate on a topic like that. The CNN moderator grew flustered, the audience erupted into a standing ovation, and a few days later, the voters of South Carolina delivered Gingrich a decisive victory in the Republican primary. Oh, <laughs> that tiger's like, I'm going to eat your face. <laughs> After a few hours at the zoo, Gingrich is ready for the next leg of our field trip, as, so we squeeze into the back of a black SUV and start driving across town towards the Academy of Natural Sciences, where there are some really neat dinosaur fossils he would like to show me. One of the hard things about talking with Gingrich is that he weaves partisan attack lines into casual conversation so matter-of-factly and so frequently that after a while they begin to take on a white noise quality. He will say something like, quote, I mean, the party of socialism and anti-Semitism is probably not very desirable as a governing party, and you won't bother challenging him or fact-checking him or arching an eyebrow. In fact, you might not even notice. His smarter-than-thou persona seems so impenetrable, his mind so unchangeable, that after a while you just give up on anything approaching a regular human conversation. It's tr that's a good point. But the zoo appears to have put Gingrich in high spirits, and for the first time all day he seems relaxed, loose, even a little gossipy. Slurping from a McDonald's cup as we ride through the streets of Philadelphia, he shares stray observations from the 2016 campaign trail. Trump really is a fast food obsessive, Gingrich confides, but I'm told they currently have him on a diet, and tosses in a bit of Clinton concern trolling for good measure. I've known Hillary since 93. I think it would be extraordinarily hard to be married to Bill Clinton and lose twice. It reinforces the whole sense that he was the real deal and she wasn't. Alas, he says, it's been sad to see his old friend resort to bitter recrimination since her defeat. The way she is handling it is the way she is handling it is self-destructive. When Trump first began thinking seriously about running for president, he turned to Gingrich for advice. The two men had grown, or excuse me, had known each other for years. The Gingriches were members of Trump's golf club in Virginia. And one morning in January 2015, they found themselves in Des Moines, Iowa, for a conservative conference. Over breakfast at the downtown Marriott, Trump peppered Newt and Callista with questions about running for president. Most pressingly, how would, much would it cost him to fund a campaign through the South Carolina primary? Gingrich had estimated that it would take about $70 million or $80 million to be competitive. Ah! Uh -huh. I already signed up! <laughs> Stupid uh, e e as Gingrich tells it, Trump considered this and then replied, 70 to 80 million, that would be a yacht. That would be a lot more fun than, this would be a lot more fun than a yacht. Oh my God. <sighs> and so began the campaign that Gingrich would call a watershed moment for America's future. Early on, Gingrich set himself apart from other prominent conservatives by talking, talking up Trump's candidacy on TV and defending him against attacks from the GOP establishment. Newt watched the Trump phenomenon take hold and metastasize, and he saw the parallels to his own rise, says Kellyanne Conway, a senior advisor to the president who worked with Gingrich in the 1990s. Ha! Huh, shocker. He recognized the echoes of, you can't do this, this is a joke, you're unelectable, don't even try, you should be bowing to the people who have credentials. Newt heard all that before. See you later, Tom. Uh, let's see. Have a good time doing chores. I hope the weather's nice. I like Asheville, too. I like ro uh, uh, Rocky Top, no, Blowing Rock, Blowing Rock, which is outside of Asheville. I think it's overrun with tourists, and I apologize to the residents of Blowing Rock, but it is a beautiful place. Uh, Conway told me, oops, Trump's response to cast all his skeptics as part of the same corrupt class of insiders and crooks borrowed from the strategy Gingrich had modeled, Conway told me. Long before there was Drain the Swamp, there was Newt's Throw the Bums Out. Once Trump clinched the nomination, he rewarded Gingrich by putting him on the vice presidential shortlist. For a while, it looked like it might really happen. Gingrich had the support of the most influential inner circlers like Sean Hannity, who flew him out on a private jet to meet with Trump on the campaign trail. But alas, a Trump-Gingrich ticket was not to be. There were, it turned out, certain optical issues that would have proved difficult to spin. As Ed Rollins, who ran, ran a pro-Trump super PAC, put it at the time, It'd be a ticket with six former wives, kind of like Henry VIII thing. Oh my God. 
I know. I, <laughs> there's a, hey man, welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> we have, ow. We have, we have helicopters. The LAPD love their helicopters. Okay. Um, uh, oh, after Trump was elected, I didn't even do this. After Trump was elected, Gingrich's name was floated for several high profile administration posts. Eager to affirm his centrality in this hinge of history moment, he started publicly implying that he had turned down the job of Secretary of State in favor of a sweeping self designed role with ambiguous responsibilities. General planner, he called it, or senior planner, or maybe chief planner. In fact, according to a transition official, Gingrich had little interest in giving up his lucrative private sector side hustles and was never really in the running for a cabinet position. Instead, he had two requests, that Trump's team leak that he was being considered for high office and that Callista, a lifelong Catholic, be named ambassador to the Holy See. Gingrich disputes this account. I runway change. Yeah, exactly. Runway change. Um, yeah, Tina has jets now. The Vatican gig was widely coveted, and there was some concern that Callista's public history of adultery would prompt the Pope to reject her appointment. But the Gingriches were friendly with a number of American cardinals, and Callista's nomination sailed through. In Washington, the appointment was seen as a testament to the self parodic nature of the Trump era, but in Rome, the arrangement had worked surprisingly well. Robert Mickens, a longtime Vatican journalist, told me that Callista is generally viewed as the ceremonial face of the embassy, while Newt, who told me he talks to the White House 10 to 15 times a week, acts as the shadow ambassador. Meanwhile, back in the States, Gingrich got to work, uh, got to work marketing himself as the premier public intellectual of the Trump era. Ever since he was a young congressman, he had labored to cultivate a cerebral image, often schlepping piles of books into meetings on Capitol Hill. As an exercise in self-branding, at least, the effort seemed to have worked. When I sent an email asking Paul Ryan what he thought of Gingrich, he responded with a pro forma statement describing the former speaker as an ideas guy twice in the space of six sentences. Yet wading through Gingrich's various books, articles, and think tank speeches about Trump, it is difficult to identify any coherent set of ideas animating his support for the president. He is not a natural booster for the economic nationalism espoused by people like Steve Bannon, nor does he seem particularly smitten with the isolationism Trump championed on the stump. Instead, Gingrich seems drawn to Trump the larger-than-life leader, virile and masculine, dynamic and strong, brimming with total energy as he mows down every enemy in his path. Donald Trump is the grizzly bear in the Revenant. Gingrich gushed during a December 2016 speech on the principles of Trumpism at the Heritage Foundation. If you get his attention, he will get awake. He will walk over, bite your face off, and sit on you. Oh, well, that's charming. That's what I look for in my leaders. In Trump, Gingrich has found the apothesis. Apothesis? I probably am not saying that. Uh, like, uh, well, sorry. Uh, of the primate politics he has been practicing his entire life, nasty, vicious, and unconcerned with those pesky Boy Scout words as he fights in the Darwinian struggle that is American life today. Trump's America and the post-American society that the anti-Trump coalition represents are incapable of coexisting. Oh boy. Uh, Gingrich writes in his most recent book, one will simply defeat the other. There is no room for compromise. Trump has understood this perfectly since day one. I don't know if he really has understood it. I think he fell into it, but okay. For much of 2018, Gingrich has been channeling, had been, has been channeling his energies towards shaping the GOP's midterm strategy, writing messaging memos. Oh, so he's default for, he's at blame for all that. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, let's see. Feeling, writing messaging memos and fielding phone calls from candidates across the country. During one early morning meeting a couple of months after our zoo trip our conversation is repeatedly interrupted by gingrich's cell phone blaring the 70s disco song dancing queen his chosen ringtone gingrich tells me he is advising party leaders to stick to really big themes in their midterm messaging and then offers the following as examples tax cuts lead to economic growth we need to work rather than welfare ms-13 is really bad he predicts that if Democrats win back the House, they will try to impeach Trump, but he is bullish about the president's chances of survival. 
The problem the Democrats are going to have is really simple, he tells me. Everything they're going to charge Trump with will be irrelevant to most Americans. He says that most of the explosive revelations that have come out of the Russia investigation are unintelligible to the average person. You're driving your kids to soccer, you're worried about your mom in the nursing home, and you're thinking about your job, and you're going, this is Washington crap. This is hilarious. I ask Gingrich whether he, as someone who follows Washington crap rather closely and does not have kids to drive to soccer, worries at all about the mounting evidence of coordination between Russians and the Trump campaign. Gingrich guffaws. The idea that you would worry about what Michael Cohen said, or what some porn star may or may not have done before she was arrested by the Cincinnati police. <laughs> oh, we're going to stay here for a minute. Uh, he is revving up now and his voice is getting higher. I mean, this whole thing is a parody. I tell everybody we live in the age of the Kardashians. This is all Kardashian politics. Noise followed by noise followed by hysteria followed by more noise creating big enough celebrity status so you can sell the hats with your name on it and become a millionaire. Well, guess what, Newt? Strap in. Because that bitch is sitting in court today because of that porn star. She owns his ass. So sit on that, Newt. Snoot. This sounds like it's intended as a criticism of our political culture, but given his loyalty to Trump, arguably the world's most successful pr practitioner of Kardashian politics, I can't quite tell. When I point out the apparent dissonance, Gingrich is ready with a counter. If you want to see genius, look at the hat, he tells me. What does the hat say? Make America great again? I respond. Gingrich nods, nods triumphantly, as though he's just achieved checkmate. It doesn't say Donald Trump. A few afters out of, after parting ways with Gingrich, I take my seat in the cavernous downtown Philadelphia theater, where more than 2,000 people are waiting to hear him speak. The crowd of mostly white, mostly well-dressed attendees isn't particularly partisan. The event is part of a lecture series that includes speakers like Gloria Steinem and Dave Barry. But at this moment of political upheaval, they seem eager to hear from a seasoned Washington insider. Shortly after 8 o'clock, Gingrich takes the stage. How many of you find what's going on kind of confusing, he asks. Raise your hand. Hundreds of hands go up as laughter ripples across the theater. Any of you who do not find this confusing, he says, are delusional. And yet, over the next 75 minutes, Gingrich doesn't offer much clarity. Instead, he begins with a travelogue of his day at the zoo. It was a wonderful break from that other zoo. And then lurches into a rambling story about the T-Rex skull he used to display in his office when he was speaker. He reminisces about time making him man of the year in 1995 and spends several minutes describing the technological advancements in private space travel, of a hobby horse of his. At one point, he pauses to lavish praise on the restaurant scene in Rome. At another, he simply starts listing impressive titles he has held over the course of his career. From my seat in the balcony, I'm struck by how thoroughly Gingrich seems to be enjoying himself, not just on stage, but in the luxurious quasi-retirement he has carved out. He is dabbling in geopolitics, dining in fine Italian restaurants. When he feels like traveling, he crisscrosses the Atlantic in business class, opining on the issues of the day from bicontinental TV studios and giving speeches for $600 a minute. $600 a minute? Oh my God. There is time for reading and writing and midday zoo trips, and even he will admit it's a very fun life. The world may be burning, but Newt Gingrich is enjoying the spoils. As he nears the end of his remarks, Gingrich adopts a somber tone. I will tell you, he says, I could never quite have imagined our political structure being as chaotic as it currently is. I could never ha quite have imagined the kind of political gridlock that we've gotten into. For a moment, it almost sounds as if Gingrich is on the brink of a confession, an acknowledgement of what he has wrought, an apology, perhaps, for setting us on this course. But it turns out he is just setting up an attack line aimed at congressional Democrats for opposing a Republican spending bill. I should have known. By the time Gingrich shuffles off stage, many in the audience seem to have lost patience with him. As we file out of the theater, I catch snippets of grumpy reviews. Waste of time. He didn't even answer the questions. The last speaker was much better. One man grumbles, 
I think that guy's done more to fuck up our democracy than anyone. That may seem like an overly harsh assessment, but tomorrow morning, when these people turn on the news, they will see footage of a reckless president who ascended to the White House on the power of televised politics. In a few months, their airwaves will be polluted with nasty attack ads. They will read stories about partisan impeachment efforts and looming government shutdowns, and lawmakers adept at name call, more adept at name-calling than passing legislation. And though he won't be there to say it in person, Gingrich will be somewhere out in the world, at a trattoria along Via Veneto, or perched comfortably in a, nabl- a cable news green room thinking, you're welcome. Oh my God, oh my God. Snoot Gingrich, you're a pig. <laughs> you're a pig, Snoot Gingrich. Wow. Oh, you guys were talking about travel. I love that. I think that's so cool. I feel like I've, I've traveled, you know, a little bit, not a lot. I'm ready to not like super global travel unless I'm kind of like going somewhere to stay for a minute. Oh, well, that was fun. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and end this little stream. But thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I really do. I know it's busy, busy time, busy day. Lots of stuff going on. So definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I will see you. Uh, I think we have something tomorrow. I think we have, yeah, we have Louder Milk tomorrow. That's right, we do. Louder Milk tomorrow morning, same time, same channel. All right. Well, I will see you all in the funny papers. I guess. Are there still funny papers? I don't even know. All right.